Composed of a body and soul, humans have always strived for further development, ushering in their own evolution and taking measured steps to devise absolute convenience. Innovation begins with a single thought, one invention to revolutionize the ways in which the cogs of reality turn. Oftentimes ambition is lauded in society, however, restraint is a tool of equal importance. Being capable of achieving a certain goal does not justify pursuing it. The city of Krat has seen both technological advancement of the highest caliber and a tragic descent of extreme proportion, from a bustling city full of vigor to a land marred with death and disease. How did such misfortune befall the city of Krat? Before we continue, we would like to take a moment to talk about this video's sponsor. This game is available on PC and mobile and includes both PvE and PvP content. It features incredible graphics, gruelling boss battles, tactical gameplay and over 800 champions, all ranging from different races such as demons, elves, orcs and dwarves. My personal favourite champion is the Stag Knight, a warrior who specialises in strengthening his party and debuffing the enemy. This game is currently celebrating its 5 year anniversary anniversary. Along with this special celebration comes unique bonuses worth $100. This includes the champion, Lady Atessa. 500,000 silver and many other goodies. On top of this, once you reach level 25, you'll get a further 500,000 silver, epic skill tomes and potions. Use promo code FESTIVAL5 to receive another epic champion Tyrell and an endless trove of rewards. These bonuses are all available by downloading Raid Shadow Legends only via the link in the description or by scanning the QR code. Even if you've played in the past, this game has and continues to receive constant updates. A new mythical tier of champions was introduced. These new champions are powerful beyond measure. They can utilise special abilities such as metamorph skills, allowing them to transform between two forms. This new tier of heroes brings higher levels of power, versatility and utility. In addition, Cursed City is one of Raid's biggest features introduced since the Doom Tower. In my opinion, it is my favourite mode due to its engaging gameplay and plentiful rewards. It involves 100 stages, some of which include battling multiple bosses at once. Clear stages each month to earn valuable rewards, including a mythical champion, and confront Amias, the Lunar Archon. The party never stops in Teleria. You're all invited to the Festival of Creation, a huge party which brings with it events, tournaments, summon boosts, free gifts, and so much more. Among these activities is a fusion event for the brand new legendary Armands the Magnificent a powerful and mysterious champion who would make a fine addition to your collection. The event runs from March 7th to the 22nd, so download Raid now and join the party. There has never been a better time to join Raid. The rewards are truly generous, allowing you to climb fast through the ranks. Join me in Teleria under the name Brothers Code and join our clan, the Chosen Undead. Please click the link in the description or scan the QR code and we'll be legends together. Krat was once a poor coastal town, financially supported by local wealthy families, a responsibility that would be passed down for generations. With new forces such as the alchemists settling within the city, the old families of Krat struggled to maintain their power. Change began to form, an industrial revolution was imminent, a golden era for Krat. The alchemists were the quintessence of evolution, a unified group of scientists, doctors and engineers. Above all else, they were a symbol of innovation, seeking truth based on their own culture and religious precepts. The leader of the alchemists, a man named Valentinus Monad, was a brilliant doctor and archaeologist with a knack for decoding ancient texts. He searched for the legend of eternal life with his colleagues for a long time. He settled down in Krat after finally finding a clue there. With the alchemists' capital and technology, Krat began to develop. Although there were some who disliked the alchemists, no one could deny that they breathed new life into the city. In their search for immortality, the alchemists discovered the relic of Trismegistus, a mining ground that yielded a mysterious substance known as Ergo. Ergo is a manifestation of a person's memories, life essence and time. Upon death, a person's essence is transformed into Ergo, which is consumed by a mineral known as Crowd, causing the Ergo to grow larger in size. No one knows when the inorganic cluster structure called Crowd sunk its roots in Krat. The first documented record is 600 years ago, when there was a ground collapse in the west of Krat. The people who collected the bodies of the farmers and mules who died found unknown minerals and ruins at the bottom of the pit, but they didn't know their value at the time. 
There is some mystery as to exactly when and how Ergo was discovered. However, there is no dispute when it comes to the alchemists as the ones who discovered Ergo's value. The fact that such an incredible mineral exists in Krat is a blessing from God. The alchemists performed endless research on Ergo. They intuitively understood its incredible potential, but also knew their limitations, calling upon technicians from various regions for aid. If there was one man capable of creating life from a mysterious power stone, it would be the exceptionally talented and tenacious craftsman, Geppetto. The old man devised a specialized mechanical heart through the use of Ergo to serve as a power source for the creation of puppets. The heart was known as a P-organ. The introduction of automated puppets drastically improved the quality of life of the citizens of Krat. This invention inevitably caused the powered sources of the old era to become obsolete. The workshop puppets are intricate like humans and they perform their master's orders so naturally that people wonder if they have souls. Many competitors try to replicate the workshop's special mechanical hearts, only to fail and prove the outstanding gap between their capabilities. Due to their expendable nature, puppets were made to replace much of the labor workforce. They fulfilled duties of public servants, maids, and handled menial tasks. For decades, ergo mining was the central interest of Kratz technicians. No matter how much they mined with their various tools, the ore never ran dry. The workers who suffered pain from the rock drill's strong recoil complained. Ironically, they too were replaced by puppets. In this booming industry of automation, there was little tolerance for human error. Not only that, but the use of puppets mitigated the need for human rights or health and safety measures within a workforce. Why am I using labor of puppets that cost so much money, you ask? Because we can't have humans explode. No one remembers the number of labor of puppets who died in the explosion. No one besides the puppets, that is. The advancement of automated puppets unwittingly started causing an imbalance throughout all of Krat. However, the people who had grown accustomed to convenience turned a blind eye to the social contradictions and discomfort. In time, signs of life began to show within puppets. The first recorded instance of paranormal behavior was enacted by a maid. Despite being in the early phase, when the design was rudimentary, Camille caught and saved a baby who fell from a crib. Such function was nowhere to be found in the design. Her appearance and identity in living years were similar, so it was probably easier for her to manifest an ego. As established, ergo is the essence of a deceased person. The report informs that if the puppet harnessing a person's essence shares a similar identity to that person, they are more likely to gain a consciousness of their own. This is referred to as manifesting an ego. After hurriedly collecting Camille to launch an investigation, the Order found out that she understands language and got a message, send me back to my child. Panic ensued within the community. Was this a manufacturing fault or a miracle from God? The maid Camille may have been the first to gain a consciousness, but she certainly wouldn't be the last. The growth of the puppet industry is in part credited to a man named Lorenzini Vinini, who helped make the product accessible citywide. Vinini is the prince of high society, a genius inventor, and the richest man in Krat. Along with his love for extravagance, he is notorious for his narcissism and various quirks. However, few are aware of the tragedy he experienced in his youth. Young V witnessed his parents' murder happen before his very eyes. The true nature of the death of V's parents was covered up. Officially, they're victims of a homicide during a mugging. Even though V experienced such a tragedy in his youth, he grew up with a cheerful personality and became a well-known person whom any parents would be proud of. However, there is no one who knows that V secretly requests for the case history every year and that his request is always denied. Suspicion surrounded this tragedy at the time, and there is known to have been pressure from the workshop and the alchemists throughout the investigation. The most interesting hypothesis is that the murderer is not human. In the interest of business, the news that there's a murderer of puppets made of steel walking amongst the populace could not be made public. Feeling a sense of crisis, the alchemists and the workshop announced the creation of the Grand Covenant. The Grand Covenant is a set of absolute commands imprinted on puppets when they are made. First law, all puppets must obey their creator's commands. Second law, 
A puppet may not harm humans. Third law. A puppet protects and serves humans and the city of Krat. Fourth law. A puppet cannot lie. Shaped by his childhood trauma, Vanini built his own workshop at the young age of 18 to ensure that his production company would mitigate any manufacturing errors that had been made in previous iterations. Vanini works as unparalleled in their ability to mass produce high quality puppets. It set the industry standard for what was capable in the automated puppet industry. This was to no surprise as Vanini collaborated with Geppetto, placing the creator as the workshop president. In Krat, Ergo was invaluable. It was both the city's power source and form of currency. With such high demand, the quality of the supply was often questionable. I conducted a quality investigation on the Ergo supplied by the alchemists. Of course, it was done secretly. Certainly, the quality of Ergo was getting worse over time. I don't doubt the alchemists, but the decrease in quality is too widespread to call it a coincidence. According to a reliable source, the high-level alchemists are running ergo production experiments lately using another method. Personally, I think their secret experiments have something to do with the decrease in ergo quality. As we know, the alchemist's primary motive has always been the acquisition of eternal life. It was the very reason they began researching ergo. As of yet, their secret experiments remain unknown, but their negligence calls for a pending disaster. Soon after, a plague originating from an unknown source began to spread throughout Krat. It would be named the Petrification Disease. In the early days, it was seen as a unique disease that only manifested in some social classes, just like black lung, which only occurred among coal miners. This, however, could not be the case, as the first to be exposed to the disease were the alchemists. Although there are many who were experts in the field of medicine, everyone was helpless in the face of this new disease. Those afflicted first experienced severe cold symptoms, followed by stone scales growing on their body, and finally, the victims suffered from organ failure and died. The petrification disease was not only a danger to the people infected, but also those around them. Side effects include disassociative amnesia, seizures, aggressive urges, and hallucinations. For this reason, people with the disease were quarantined. Krat established strict rules regarding entry into the city in an effort to prevent its puppet technology from leaking. When the petrification disease started spreading like wildfire, it was these same rules that trapped the citizens within the city walls. The petrification disease was determined to have emerged as a result of overexposure to ergo. This explains the first occurrence being amongst the alchemists, as they were the main supplier of ergo. Acting quickly, the alchemists publicly announced that they had developed a cure. Iterations of the cure were tested on hundreds of patients, but the results weren't promising. Those injected with the elixir experienced painful necrosis and skin ruptures, seizures and convulsions, and crystalline metastases throughout the body. Ultimately, they became mutations known as carcasses. Before the cure could be released to the public, a man named Dr. Clark Shaw would recreate the vaccine himself, using records stolen from the alchemists. His confession reveals the following. Early on, the cure really was effective in neutralizing the petrification disease. I know I stole it, but I perfectly followed the manufacturing processes. My cure was perfect. But what went wrong? I dare not record what the ones who got treatment turned into. That was literally hell. And when I realized that I was the gatekeeper who opened the doors, I ran away. How can I atone for my sins? I'm dying and this is my penitence. I also have the petrification disease, but I'm not getting the cure. I'd rather turn to stone and freeze to death. The cure was not the solution he had imagined. Witnessing the effects of the elixir, the doctor would soon die before injecting it into himself. The question remains, how could the alchemists have announced a cure, knowing that their elixir possessed major flaws? Perhaps the result was exactly what was intended. Whilst Krat was preoccupied with the evolution of automated puppets, the alchemists have been operating in the shadows, secretly conducting experiments with the goal of attaining immortal life. It is plausible to assume that the cure made by the alchemists was no attempt at a cure at all, but a solution to death. 
Those who were afflicted with the petrification disease volunteered themselves to be treated by the alchemists. Little did they know, they were used as guinea pigs for experimentation. The alchemists traded human lives as a method of trial and error. With every life taken, they were one step closer in their pursuit. To make matters worse, a new problem arose, one that would rival the crisis of the petrification disease. The puppets that were once a staple of society would turn hostile, killing anyone and everyone in their wake. The occurrence began on Rosa Isabel Street, resulting in hundreds of casualties. While the cause is still unknown, the number of the casualties and the scale of the damage are both growing. As the crisis dragged on, the workshop and Vanini company, Kratz's largest puppet factory, announced that they would offer emergency supplies to the citizens and do everything they could to alleviate the situation. A task force is investigating the possibility of the fatal loss of the Grand Covenant, which is the control protocol of the workshop's puppets. The puppet frenzy birthed a generation that lost their families and swore revenge. A war was waged upon humanity by their very creation. There was no warning, no chance for preparation, no time for caution. When the puppets suddenly attacked, technicians scrambled to make weapons. As for their fate, they were technicians, not warriors. Unfortunately, none managed to wield a blunt weapon properly until every last one of them was killed. The citizens who retaliated most effectively were cooks. Their knives, that were once used to prepare feasts, were repurposed to slaughter puppets. The frenzy brought out humanity's most natural instinct, and only the fittest would survive. Before long, stalkers, who were the armed guards of the privileged class, were dispatched to regain order within the city. The stalkers are Kratz vigilantes. There are two groups of them, the bastards and the sweepers. The bastards are from noble families, whereas the sweepers are from the alleys. The relationship between the organizations is the very definition of enmity. It is said that the bastards were abandoned by their families, but they couldn't abandon their pride. Clutching nothing but their honor, the bastards charged forward, spears in hand. Social dignity can be seen not only in the ballroom, but also on the battlefield. The leader of the bastards did not lose his poise on either stage. The bastards' forces were split, however, as when the alchemists became prominent organizations within Krat, those who didn't fit in with Krat's ruling class opted to join forces with the alchemists. They dreamt of a promising future in the flow of a new era. Their motto was, honor or nothing. The brutality of the alleyways can be tamed by no one. The sweepers came mostly from the alleyways, and their fighting style is rough and ruthless. This league of stalkers were loyal to the old families of Krat. Alienated from the prosperity of the city, their interests aligned with the old powers who were jealous of new forces. Their motto was, we always repay what is owed. When the puppet frenzy emerged, the orders given were as follows. If you don't have a weapon to kill puppets with, use a shovel if you have to. Stalkers followed the orders of their incompetent commander. However, the attack was not on their enemy, but on him. Chaos decays the facade upheld by humanity. What remains is the truth that the foundations of society are fragile and civility is abandoned at the first sign of disruption. The surge of the puppet frenzy brought the city of Krat to a halt. It was believed that the Grand Covenant was broken. Blood flowed through the city like a river stream and corpses were buried in mass graves. The invention that propelled the city of Krat would cause its utmost downfall. During the catastrophe, the leader of the alchemists, Valentinus Monad, was confirmed dead. Out of respect, the citizens of Krat erected a statue in his honor. The divisive presence of the alchemists within Krat was more evident than ever, as before long, his statue was defamed. Sources state that Valentinus died in a mysterious accident, and his beloved daughter went missing. It is as though his passing was by design. Simon Manus, who started from the bottom ranks, eventually became the leader of the alchemists, thanks to his competence and charisma. The creator of the automated puppet, Geppetto, would suffer a grave loss of his own. His son Carlo passed away from the petrification disease, leaving the old man broken beyond repair. In a desperate effort to retaliate against the forces of evil, Geppetto exercised his lifelong experience as a craftsman, placing the fate of humanity in one final creation, his magnum opus, Pinocchio.
Geppetto's Muppet. We need your help. Awakened by a mysterious voice, P finds himself in a train cart in Krat Central Station. The boy is equipped with nothing but the clothes on his back, a white shirt imbued with someone's kind consideration. The voice calls out once again. My name is Sophia. Please come to Hotel Krat and I'll explain what's happening. Jiminy, please escort him to the hotel. Surrounded by a pool of blood is a small lamp with a cricket guide puppet inside. It illuminates the darkness with a faint light. Do not be afraid even if you get lost in the fog. The cricket guide will be with you. The cricket is a companion named Gemini, who is a mirror of Jiminy Cricket, a character from the original Pinocchio tale. In preparation for the journey ahead, we pick up arms and sharpen our blade. To those in battle, the grinder is their lifeline. The sharpness of their blade can mean life or death. A pulse cell is equipped to heal battle scars, and a last resort is in our supply, a mechanism which kills the user upon activation. The old man feared the possibility of his son failing to awaken properly and going into a frenzy. This initialization device was made as a necessary evil for delicate readjustments. Emerging from the train, we witness trails of blood connected to countless bodies left to rot in the streets. When the puppet frenzy began, the citizens were advised to stay indoors for their safety. However, many fled to Krat Central Station with the goal of escaping the city. This only caused further panic and chaos, trapping the civilians in a confined space for slaughter. The citizens expected police officers and military police puppets to handle the situation. What they failed to realize is that they too were puppets. Progressing to the plaza, we are introduced to a stargazer. These survival devices were once used to capture ergospores that caused the petrification disease. This allowed for the creation of safety hubs. The stalkers took interest in their utility and added various features, turning them into survival bases. Interestingly, the name Stargazer is likely a reference to Disney's Pinocchio, where Geppetto gazes upon a shooting star and wishes for his puppet to come to life. Breaking through a locked gate, the boy stands to face the Parade Master, a remarkable puppet crafted by the workshop in commemoration of the Grand Exhibition. The parade was set to demonstrate Kratz's technological prowess to the world, but was delayed in the wake of the puppet frenzy and in the end never came to fruition. The Parade Master is inspired by Manja Foco, who in the original Pinocchio novel is the puppet master of the Great Marionette Theatre. He kidnaps Pinocchio due to interrupting his show and plans to use him as firewood for his dinner. Feeling remorse for the boy's cries, he would later release him without repercussions. In this tale, the boy isn't so helpless. Utilizing the weapons in our arsenal, the Parade Master is defeated. Advancing ahead, we appear before Hotel Krat, said to be one of the city's creepiest and most mysterious buildings. According to lore, Hotel Krat is an isolated castle built by an aristocrat devoted to a form of occultism after receiving a revelation from a radiant tree. At one point, it was used as a mental institution and some patients said they saw hallucinations. However, no records remain as they were all destroyed in a large fire. Above all, being so far underground just compounds the rumors. Some even said that it is connected to an unknown hell. But now, the rumors have served to embellish the charm of Hotel Krat, which has been renovated in the latest style. Now a safe haven for survivors, Hotel Krat only welcomes humans. Upon approaching, P is asked to prove his identity. Is he a puppet or a human? The hotel security system still adheres to the Grand Covenant, and since puppets should only be capable of telling the truth, proving one's humanity is as simple as lying. To gain access, the boy is forced to speak into existence his first ever lie. Human, he mutters, before entering the premise. I am Sophia. I've been waiting for you. Searched all over the city of Krat to find you. You must have questions. Geppetto will have answers, but we have to find him first. He was last seen on Elysian Boulevard. 
Sophia is a listener, someone with the unique ability to hear ergo. She inherited the power from her mother, who hated it, labeling it as the devil's power. For this reason, Sophia's ability to talk to puppets was kept a secret. Sophia provides a Moonface pocket watch, an item imbued with a mystical power. The watch turns back time to when the boy was in peak condition. Should the need arise, the time manipulating device will rewind time to undo the boy's demise. Sophia is representative of the fairy with turquoise hair from the tale of Pinocchio. Later iterations would reimagine the character as the blue fairy. Comparable to the original tale, Sophia's role is to be the voice of reason for the boy. In this instance, guiding him on his journey of reinstating order into a world of chaos. Before embarking on our mission, we make ourselves acquainted with the inhabitants of the hotel. At the reception is Polandina, butler to Lady Antonia, who is the owner of Hotel Krat. In the adventures of Pinocchio, Polandina was a nickname given by children to Geppetto. In the hallway left of the reception, Antonia is found sitting in a wheelchair, gazing at a large self-portrait from her youth. She is the queen of high society and was once famous for her good looks. Although the petrification disease gnaws away at her health, it hasn't taken away from her elegant dignity. Antonia is likely a nod to Master Antonio from the original tale, also referred to as Master Cherry. He was the first to discover the log which would be carved into Pinocchio. Concerned by the log's magical nature, Antonio gifted it to his friend Geppetto. Interestingly, Antonio's surname is Cesarani, which is derived from the word Cheraza translating to cherry in Italian. In the armory, we encounter Eugenie, a technician from the workshop union. She has virtually no memory of her past or family either, but she does recall a particular stalker who rescued her during the collapse of the workshop tower. Eugenie originates from the country of the morning beyond the ocean. Her family was a house of weapon specialists, and as such, she is proficient in weapons of all kinds. Unfortunately, she was deserted at a young age and has since lived to create her own legacy. Additionally, the name Eugenie is a callback to a character from the original tale named Eugenio, who is Pinocchio's classmate in school. An essential member of the hotel community is Spring the Cat, who initially appears distant, hissing at the boy as he attempts to pet it. An interesting detail, as P gains more humanity, the cat begins to sense his warmth and slowly grows to be comfortable around him. Now familiar with the hotel, we center our attention to finding Geppetto. In doing so, we step foot in Elysium Boulevard. Downtown Krat had become death row due to the puppet frenzy. Even today, a significant number of survivors live quietly behind locked doors, curtained windows, and basements. Who is it? Is that you, Murphy? Oh. Sorry, I, I thought you were my friend, Murphy. <laughs> Murphy is a super cool police officer. <clears throat> As a puppet, even the petrification disease can't get him. <laughs> I wish I was like him. You should leave so you don't catch the disease from me. Toma is a survivor who is inflicted with a petrification disease. Living out his final days, he wishes for nothing more than to be reunited with his friend Murphy so that they could play together one last time. Cries of desperation echo loudly through the streets of Krat, grief for those who have passed and silent suffering for those who are left. My family took my baby from me and sent me here. They said it was for my own good, but it was heartless just the same. A baby must be with its mother. Please go to Quart City Hall and bring me my baby. Stricken with the petrification disease, the weeping woman was separated from her baby Elena and transferred to a quarantine zone. With hard scales spreading across her face and her eyesight fading, the woman has little time left. Her last wish is to see her child's face again before it's too late. In Krat City Hall, a broken baby puppet can be retrieved. If given to the weeping woman, she states the following. You found her, kind one. Oh, 
my sweet Elena. There, there, my baby. I missed you so much. <laughs> what do you think? Is my baby adorable? It is here that P is once again presented with a conundrum. Do we tell the truth and reveal that the baby is a puppet or mutter a lie and tell her that her child is cute? With what little time she has to live, we choose to nurture the hope she has in her heart, a lasting joy that will follow her to her grave. She's a cute baby, the boy states. You granted me my only wish. <laughs> my sweet Elena. <sighs> going to be happy now. Continuing forward, we approach a large bridge with a puppet hung from its strings at the entrance. The Alchemist Bridge is the bridge on Elysian Boulevard and the main way to Krat City Hall. The Holy Ouroboros, the mark of the alchemists, is fittingly engraved into the bridge. This shows that the alchemists are not just a powerful privileged class, but have also donated tremendous amounts of money across the city. At the end of the bridge, we find a man stood before a carriage. Hidden inside is Geppetto, aware that he's the creator of the puppets. The mad donkey is adamant that Geppetto knows the cause of the puppet frenzy. The madman who was now terminally ill no longer feared puppets or the petrification disease. He simply wanted to know the truth, the reason for his colleague's bloodshed. Upon approach, the mad donkey turns his attention to P. Identifying the boy as one of Geppetto's creations, he draws his blade. Blinded by his stubbornness, he fails to see the approach of death. When the battle is won, Geppetto steps out of the carriage. The boy glares at his own hand, which had become a canvas for blood. For the first time, he had taken the life of a human being. Looking up, the boy locks eyes with his maker. It's a dream come true, seeing you like this. I understand why some people despise me. I invented the puppets after all. I should take responsibility as their maker. But in order for me to do that, I need to take care of the puppets at City Hall. Won't you help me, son? Clearing our way through Krat City Hall, we are halted by the scrapped watchman an ambitious creation of Vinini, who sought to make a jolly police mascot puppet for the city hall. His passion to make a trustworthy friend for the citizens and a strong officer who overpowers criminals was in the right place, but turned out to be excessive. The new police officer puppet's overcharged storage battery exceeded its capacity, causing chain explosions, malfunctions, and serious body damage. The city council recommended disposing of the puppet on the grounds that its appearance intimidates visitors. But Mr. Venini and the taxpayers protested, halting the council's plan in its tracks. Whilst the case was ongoing, the puppet was temporarily abandoned, but nonetheless, it found its own calling. Even when the puppet is unattended, it performs a number of its mascot roles. It is especially popular with kids, and it even appears to react and respond to the playing of children. Local children from underprivileged parts of Krat endearingly named the mascot Murphy. In their eyes, the puppet wasn't a failure, but a friend. Abandoned by the adults, the children let go of their childhood to survive. Soon after, the broken police puppet accompanied the children's whistles and restored the children's laughter. Murphy provided comfort for the kids where no humans could. He was a source of happiness, a warm blanket that veiled the harsh realities of life. In reverence, the children crafted a small wooden officer puppet and decorated it using stolen paint. The doll resembled Murphy and was gifted to him, a gift that the puppet would cherish deeply. As the petrification disease spread throughout Krat, it was the children from the slums who were most likely to be infected. As a result, kids such as Toma, who we had encountered at the window earlier, gradually stopped showing up to play with Murphy. Unable to reunite or play with his friends, Murphy grew resentful. He blamed the adults for the loss of his friends, as they couldn't protect them from the disease. The onset of the puppet frenzy allowed for the scrapped watchman to unleash years of bitterness. 
As he engages with the boy, he cries out the following, Children, frozen, abandoned by you, I avenge my friends. You're all guilty. I'll punish you. Zach, Sophie, Eric, Toma. The watchman took it upon himself to pass judgment on those within the city hall. His role is likely inspired by the gorilla judge from the Pinocchio novel, who sentences the boy to jail for his poor behavior. In addition, the watchman's movement is reminiscent of an ape, which further strengthens this theory. Upon the watchman's defeat, a faded whistle is found nearby, the same one that was used by the children during their play. If the whistle is blown outside of Toma's window, the child will assume that Murphy has come to play. I know that whistle. It must be Murphy. <sighs> Thanks for coming by. I want to play, but I feel too sick. I, I don't think I can. I miss Zack and Sophie and Eric. I wish we could all play. <sighs> On our return to the hotel, we speak with Geppetto. Forgive a sentimental father for worrying about his son. Always remember that you're precious to me, even when I ask you to do something dangerous. Speaking of which, there's a factory just beyond the Lycian Boulevard. It's packed with countless puppets. My friend, the inventor Venini, went to stop them, but he never came back. Please, go save him and shut down the factory. At the entrance of the workshop, a light shines upon a mysterious phone that rings indefinitely. Out of curiosity, we connect with the voice on the opposite line. By morning, it walks on feet numbering four. At midday, just two, no less and no more. It walks on three feet when the evening arrives. And if you solve this, I'll know you're alive. The riddle inquires, am I a monster or human? If the answer given is human, P is rewarded with a trinity key, which unlocks specific doors within Krat. The King of Riddles appears many times throughout our journey, each time presenting us with a new riddle. The identity of the individual is unknown as of yet. Inside Vanini Works, we encounter the survivor. Based on his mask, we can discern that he is an amateur stalker. Masks are not just for defense and fashion, but also for ranks that show off one's abilities. The link between rank and animal mask isn't clear, but mostly, the powerful ones choose their preferred mask first. On the other hand, rookie stalkers usually wear the animal masks decided by superiors. It is doubtful that the survivor willingly elected a mouse as his animal of choice. Additionally, the mouse is likely a callback to the Dormouse from the original tale, who warns Pinocchio about the donkey fever in the land of toys. The survivor is a man who forsook his oath, when the puppets toppled the tower, the youth fled in fear. He lost his sworn brother and his name that day, and became a survivor, wandering in hell. Driven by guilt over the death of his adopted brother Leo, the survivor swears to kill each and every puppet. If P wears the Blue Blood's tailcoat, which is the attire of the bastards, the survivor will mistake him for Leo, indicating that he was likely from the bastards' faction of stalkers. Identifying the boy as a puppet, the survivor enters a fit of rage. Nonetheless, only one would leave the room alive. Marching ahead, we come in contact with the Red Fox and Black Cat. The Fox is Claudia Wolf, known to be the daughter of a time-honored family. The name Wolf is derived from the word Volpe, which in Italian means fox. Conflict within the household caused Claudia to cut ties with the Wolf family and be ousted from noble succession. She later joined forces with the bastards, the Black Cat was once affiliated with the Sweepers. He joined the group as an apprentice stalker, but was reported to be inactive, ignoring ranks and neglecting duty. As a cat who had lived alone in the slums, he trusted no one but himself. However, his mind changed completely when he met the Fox. At a point in time, the Fox claimed that the cat was a relative to the Wolf family, her long lost sibling in fact. This resulted in the Sweepers conducting an unofficial interrogation to determine whether the cat was a potential spy for the bastards. 
Anyhow, the two supposed siblings would leave their factions and begin working together. Their plan was to earn enough money to leave Krat, but things changed when the black cat became ill, contracting the petrification disease. It was only a matter of time before the disease spread to his eyes and took his vision. Desperate, the duo began working with the alchemists. For each job completed, they would be paid in gold coin fruit, which they used to buy treatment. This fruit that resembles gold holds miracles and is thus a precious wonder drug. However, no matter how bewitching a miracle may be, it always comes with a price. Unfortunately, the dosage provided by the alchemists would only contain the disease, never cure it, likely done purposely to keep the stalkers under their umbrella. Upon talking to the pair, we are informed that Venini is nearby. They ventured to the factory to seek opportunities for work, but upon meeting V, would deny his request, describing it as ridiculous. In addition, the fox and the cat are characters who also exist in the tale of Pinocchio. They are depicted as con artists who lead the boy astray and unsuccessfully attempt to murder him. They trick Pinocchio into believing that they are disabled. The fox claims to be lame and the cat blind. Their goal is to locate a field of miracles where one could plant a coin in the ground and a money fruit tree would grow. In parallel, the red fox and black cat pursue a field of miracles of their own, a sacred tree which yields a boundless harvest of gold coin fruit. Further ahead, we come upon the man himself, Lorenzini Venini. Please, help me find my butler Pulcinella. He's a puppet and a friend. The factory is, of course, my priority. We must take it back. But please, keep an eye out for my... for my butler. Before we depart, Venini explains that a puppet by the name Fuoco was in charge of the factory's furnace. But since the frenzy has begun acting of its own volition, the once faithful puppet now kills humans. It creates puppets instead of fire. It obeys something else other than humans. It's as if someone is controlling it, or it has a mind of its own, as if there's a king of puppets somewhere. Here, we learn that the puppet frenzy did not arise by chance, as there is intent behind their every action. The line between humans and puppets is ever more blurred. There are those who gained an ego, others who are no longer bound by the Grand Covenant, and now, the puppets have established a hierarchy, with the king of puppets hailed as a god. The puppet dreamt of a fire that would make the king's army. At the end of a desperate fight with a boy puppet, the fanatic's burning fire was scattered into foolish ash. With the king's flame Fuoco defeated, and the manufacturing of a puppet's army brought to a halt, Venini, along with his companion, returned to the hotel. Having completed our mission, we converse with Geppetto, the cathedral is famous for its wise and kind Archbishop Andreas. He offers sanctuary to countless refugees there. The thing is, I've lost touch with them. Perhaps no news is good news, but I'm a suspicious sort. And if the puppets push towards the cathedral, it could be devastating. Go save the Archbishop and the refugees before it's too late. The cathedral was founded when Saint Frangelico met a one-winged angel. In time, Archbishop Andreas would take leadership of the church. The Archbishop was such a man of character that they called him the Saint of Krat. They say his moral influence even made murderers repent before God. However, even an honest saint like him couldn't resist the temptation of the tremendous gold that flooded into Krat. Andreas developed a relationship with the alchemists when they offered to financially support the reconstruction of the church. The continuous funds compelled Andreas to turn a blind eye to the alchemists' research, and as such, they gained control of further territories in Krat. When the petrification disease began to spread, Andreas felt a sense of responsibility for the chaos that had ensued, as the disease could have been averted had he denied the alchemists their stay. For this reason, he chose to accept refugees into the church, and took it upon himself to find a solution. To reach the cathedral, one must first tread through Moonlight Town, said to be the lowest place in the city. Since Saint Frangelico met the one-winged angel and founded the church, Moonlight Town has become known as the place where pilgrims are lifted to the cathedral by pulley and prepare for their pilgrimages. 
Today, we have cable railways instead of pulleys, and the city of the future instead of a country village. But our virtues remain unchanged. Those who admired the sufferings of the pilgrims once supposed the introduction of shortcuts such as pulleys and railways, likely believing that in making it accessible, the journey was stripped of its essence. Approaching the cable railway, we are met with the Atone, a once proud stalker who, as indicated by her name, is making amends for her past. Amidst the rise of the petrification disease, the Atoned was responsible for guiding refugees to St. Frangelico Cathedral. Inadvertently, instead of guiding people to refuge, she took them to the land of the dead. Having fled from incomprehensible death, the stalker vowed to live the rest of her life in repentance. Utilizing the railway, we reach the Path of Misery, a route once climbed by monks whilst they prayed for those in need. Populating the environment are the bodies of countless souls who fell victim to the petrification disease. Within the vicinity, a carcass approaches. As documented by Dr. Shaw, carcasses are the result of the experiments conducted by the alchemists. It is the outcome of the supposed cure being injected into patients who were predisposed to the petrification disease. Fighting through the infested land, we happen upon a mysterious man. My name is Janjo. I'm an alch... Uh, a pharmacist. Yes, pharmacist. I'm looking for the legendary gold coin fruit. I was able to use medicine to slow the infection spread. I have the petrification disease and I need a cure. Suspiciously, Giangio stutters as he claims his occupation, a sign that the man may not be who he claims. Comparable to the black cat, Giangio requires gold coin fruit to heal his disease. A ballad speaks of a tree that bears this produce. The tree's fruit resembles gold coins, and this fruit is a miraculous blessing for many people who have recovered from different diseases and who have been able to escape the plague. For now, we head towards St. Frangelico Cathedral Chapel. Made possible by the alchemist's funding, the church embodies quality with gold marble flooring and gargantuan statues erected in representation of a higher power. In truth, the cathedral is only a veil for the irreparable damages caused by carcasses. Every night, there is a monster crying in the basement. Even if I sing hymns, I can hear it in my ears. The once holy church, now plagued with disease and ravaged by carcasses, snuffs out any hope for remaining life. I'm the only one left. Everyone's dead. From the petrification disease or from the monsters. I didn't die, but my heart breaks more each day. Cecile is a nun who serves the Archbishop. She's one of few survivors left in St. Frangelico. Encountered in the library, Cecile appears oddly pale, likely to have contracted the petrification disease. She asks for the boy to acquire the Archbishop's holy mark, which can be found in his office. Oh, thank you. Just seeing the Archbishop's holy mark renews my spirit. It's a reminder of the quiet power of faith Outside the office, the Archbishop's diary can be obtained. The book reveals the following. Cecile's unwell again. Today, the Adams brothers found her standing like one of the dead at the edge of a cliff and brought her back. If it's mild sleepwalking, it's fine, but I'm worried it's her old blood compulsiveness again. I know about her strong beliefs better than anyone else, so it's really too bad. God will be glad with the atoned. Perhaps I should ask her for atonement for visiting the Isle of Alchemists. At a point in time, Cecile suffered from an uncontrollable obsession with blood. Regardless, under the guidance of the Archbishop, she actively repents through acts of service. The diary also speaks of a time when Cecile visited the Isle of Alchemists and stole the relic of Trismegistus. It was to be used by Andreas to purify the city, but instead, things took a turn for the worse. Inside the relic was a ritual trident. It is presumed to have once belonged to a great warrior who served an ancient king. The warrior of the sea vowed to protect the people from the cursed relic. This relic was kept hidden for good reason, as its emergence would reap dire consequences. In possession of the relic, the Archbishop would be warped into an unrecognizable monster. Unable to acknowledge how corrupt he had become, he escaped into a delusion that he had been chosen by the angel. Andreas had lost all sense of reality, believing to be a one-winged angel, chosen to purify Kratz from the disease which had turned people into monsters. 
What he failed to identify is that he himself had become one. As we battle the fallen archbishop, his bodily form emerges from within his monstrous shell, a mold of a human and centipede. Andreas still clasps onto the trident discovered within the cursed relic, the source of his disfigurement. His right arm appears to resemble a wing, comparable to the one-winged angel who met Saint Frangelico. Interestingly, an angel with one wing is symbolic of a fallen angel, one that had been cast out of heaven, a sign of ill omen. Andreas interpreted this as a form of affinity with a higher power, which further fed into his delusions. Following his defeat, we witness Andreas Ergo, along with that of Fuoco, Parade Master and Scrapped Watchman, leave their bodies and magnetize towards an Ergo-consuming device stored atop a tower. Seated before the device, an unknown figure relishes in his accomplishment. Who this man is, or what he plans to do with the Ergo, is yet to be revealed. With the Archbishop defeated, we find that Cecile had departed from the cathedral. Left behind is a written confession. Thank you for your kindness. I am a sinner who murdered innocent people in the past. I couldn't suppress the monster in me. Only the Archbishop saved me. Of course, he was a human who makes mistakes. Even saints succumb to wealth and power, but at least I can live as myself, and that's a huge blessing. So yes, I believe that he was a saint. Thank you for letting me live as a human, not a monster. Farewell, Cecile. Regardless of the mistakes he made, Cecile chose to remember Andreas as the saint he once was, the man who restored her spirit through the quiet power of faith. Andreas may have been liable for the loss of many lives, but he saved Cecile's. Intriguingly, had the boy not provided Cecile with the holy mark, she would have transformed into a carcass and succumbed to her bloodlust, proving that it was indeed faith that had encouraged her to persevere. Before returning to the hotel, we happen upon a world-renowned treasure hunter. Elidoro claims to be a descendant of aristocrats, who is highly knowledgeable in the ruins and relics of Krat. He states that his duty is to serve the common people, and aims to do so by collecting treasure and returning it to their rightful owners. Curiously, nobody has ever seen the face behind the famous hunting dog mask. Do you know of a place where I can take refuge? Preferably someplace clean and comfortable, you know, civilized. Placing our trust in the treasure extraordinaire, we inform him of Hotel Krat. As a point of comparison, the name Alidoro is shared by a dog in the original tale, who saves Pinocchio from being eaten by the green fisherman in the land of busy bees. Following Alidoro's arrival at the hotel, Eugenie recognizes the hound. Well, I didn't know he was still alive. Thank heavens! I haven't seen him in person, and I don't know how I'd react. How do you thank the man who saved your life? Her words imply that Alidoro is the same stalker who rescued her during the collapse of the workshop tower. Gracious, she ponders on how she may return the favor. Additionally, during our absence, Vinini devises a plan to uncover the truth behind the puppet frenzy. He predicts that something within the puppet's ergo is causing their aggression. Utilizing an ergo wavelength decoder, he may be able to find errors in the Grand Covenant imprinted on the puppets. To do so, we must first acquire more ergo. Next on our journey is the Malam District. I don't know what's happening in the Malam District. The Black Rabbit Brotherhood seized the neighborhood. And that's all I know. It was always a run-down neighborhood, but it's descended into anarchy, or worse. I'm hearing rumors of monsters rampaging through the district. Those poor people. They need your help, son. At the entrance, we once again cross paths with the Black Cat and Red Fox. The two offer to join forces with the boy to clear the neighborhood. Further in, the cat claims to need a short break from combat, leaving us to continue alone. The rain pours heavily, and every corner is filled with endless hordes of infected. Persevering, we reach the Brotherhood's hideout. The cat and the fox appear once again, seeming surprised that P still draws breath. From their reaction, we can determine that they never intended to help us take down the Brotherhood, but were rather hoping we'd fall victim to the hostile streets of Malum. 
Reliant on no one but ourselves, we break through the gate to the hideout. On the other side appear the Black Rabbit Brotherhood. The eldest brother carries a large coffin on his shoulder as to seal our fate. Inside, distinct words are written in bold, liar. The siblings fight strategically, tagging in and out of battle to treat their wounds. In a battle of endurance, the siblings are forced to retreat until the stubborn eldest is left standing alone. Refusing to yield, the brother is stricken down. Upon his death, the remaining siblings create a cloud of smoke that conceals the arena and carry their brother's corpse to safety. Now it had become personal. Sooner or later, vengeance would be served. The Brotherhood are a reference to the Undertaker rabbits in the original tale, where four black rabbits are summoned by the Blue Fairy. They arrive carrying a coffin to convince Pinocchio that he had died. This frights the boy into taking his medicine which he had initially refused. Entering the town hall, we discover a portrait. It pictures a beautiful boy with a peevish expression, but delicate face. Extremely vivid paintings are said to possess souls sometimes. D. Gray, the genius painter, denied all such conjectures. However, his death and the rumours about his paintings are still shrouded in a thick fog. The portrait references Dorian Gray, a man whose pursuit of eternal youth and beauty led to him pledging his soul to his painting, if only the portrait would bear the burden of age and infamy. Free of accountability, Dorian strived for a life of sensations, sinking deeper and deeper into sin and corruption. Whilst he maintained a young and beautiful facade, his portrait would age and deform, reflecting his shameful actions. This portrait I remember it fondly. Memories of a happier time, my son. The boy in the picture is Geppetto's son, Carlo. The portrait early resembles P, revealing that when crafting his puppet, Geppetto created P in his son's likeness. Parallels can be drawn between Carlo's portrait and the story of Dorian Gray. Whereas Dorian's age and infamy manifested within his portrait, Pinocchio's lies are reflected within Carlo's picture, symbolised physically through the growth of his nose. Upon closer inspection, P's extended nose can be seen in his shadow if stood in the vicinity of the Hotel Krat Stargazer. Continuing, we arrive at a lift which leads to a room housing Giangio. He explains that he had discovered the gold coin tree. Turns out, it was right beside the hotel. Lady Antonia was aware of this, of course. She sealed the tree away so that no one would fight for its possession. Little did she know, the Black Rabbit Brotherhood could access the tree from their quarters. Without Antonia's knowledge, they stole gold coin fruit and supplied it to the alchemists. Giangio states that he is unable to pick gold coin fruit as the tree resists him due to being afflicted with the petrification disease. Coming to aid, we acquire and present him with the fruit. Upon returning to the hotel, we report back to our creator. The Malam district was as grim as we feared, was it not? But with the Black Rabbit Brotherhood out of the picture, we can focus elsewhere. And why not strike at the root of the problem? The King of Puppets' lair is on Rosa Isabel Street. Perhaps the puppet frenzy will come to an end if we can take down their king. Rosa Isabel Street, the entertainment capital of Krat. Different types of art, music, and opera performances brought color to the city. The puppets worked while the people created art. These were known as the Days of Beauty. Rosa Isabel Street was named after the cultural sponsor, Lady Isabel Monad. The Monad family were credited for financing the Monad Charity House, also nicknamed the Rose Estate. What originally began as a charity organization for poor children was later transformed into a boarding school with high quality welfare and education. And this was all to the credit of the Monad family's sponsorship. However, with the knowledge that Lady Isabel Monad was married to the former leader of the alchemists, Valentinus Monad, their charity work reveals itself to be less genuine. The intention behind financing the district is evidently in favour of the alchemists holding more power within Krat. The Krat disaster caused the alchemists to fight among themselves. Many people died or went missing, one of whom was Valentinus himself. Now, Rosa Isabel Street is the epicentre of the puppet frenzy, a hell of fierce fire and blood. 
that's the real tragedy of the Rose estate. Traversing the streets, we encounter Julian the Gentleman. My wife's body lies on Rosa Isabel Street. There was a fire and I couldn't reach her through the flames. I know she's gone, but I hate to think of her just lying there. Would you bring me her belongings? Then I'd have something to remember her by. Upon finding his wife's body, we come to the realization that she's a puppet. Mr. J fell in love with the maid puppet at first sight, and they got married even in the face of his family's opposition. But the lover's secret wedding faced ruin. The enraged family stormed in. The husband was confused. The puppet bride was greatly damaged. On her body, we retrieve a wedding ring. Oh, my melody. This is her wedding ring. Our marriage should have been filled with joy. <laughs> I failed you, Melody. I'm sorry. Others laughed at me, but I knew the truth. I knew that she was in love with me too. Maybe I'm crazy though. <laughs> Who ever heard of a human and a puppet in love? Here, we must face our morality once again. In speaking the truth, we state that we've never seen that happen before. The boy's candid honesty shatters any hope Julian had clung on to. Not only had he lost the love of his life, but he now bears the realization that she likely never reciprocated his feelings. In time, Julian surrenders his own life. The gentleman was unable to accept that his love had been a dream. The lovers, who never managed to gain anyone's blessing, became one only after the heat had left their bodies. Alternatively, if we choose to lie, we inform Julian that his wife had left behind a message saying that she loves him. A white lie is often what is needed in a time of crisis. Oh, melody, my melody, your words were everything to me. <laughs> Although this may seem like a conclusive end, it is often said that there are three sides to every story. Hmm. The most fascinating thing, I couldn't believe it. The writing on the back of a maid puppet. Any way you look at it, it's the maid puppet's words. Upon revisiting the corpse of the maid, we discover writing etched on the wall behind her. The words read, I love you, Julian. In a twist of fate, the boy's lie became the truth. Continuing on our venture, we arrive at a small arena. A spotlight points towards a rotating puppet with a sword piercing its head. Upon interaction, the white lady crashes the scene. She immediately begins dueling the boy and states that this performance is dedicated to her sister Adelina. She appears uninterested in reasoning and strikes with a vengeful spite. In self-defense, the boy lays the woman to rest. The white lady is named Patricia. From a very young age, she, along with her sister Adelina, harbored ambitious dreams of becoming renowned actresses. In their youth, the siblings exchanged lockets as a symbol of their friendship. Patricia's locket holds a portrait of a beautiful woman in red. To stand always on the stage of our dreams together, Adelina's locket, however, holds a portrait of a pale girl stabbed repeatedly by a knife. Clearly something had caused a schism in their friendship, at least from Adelina's perspective. Whilst Patricia wanted to share in her dream, Adelina sought the spotlight for herself. It is said that Patricia's career as an actress was cut short when a poison took away her ability to sing. The bird lost her voice, but dreamt of the blue skies instead. That day was a tragic accident for all sisters. The girl who lost her golden voice became a stalker instead of an opera singer. Patricia came to be known as the White Lady. Following the surge of the puppet frenzy, Patricia believed that her sister Adelina was killed and therefore dedicated a stage in her remembrance. For every puppet she dismantled, the stage would be adorned with new decorations. Unraveling the truth, we learn that Adelina is still alive and was the cause of Patricia's tragic fate. As the siblings began making a name for themselves, the spotlight would always favor Patricia, as her singing voice was unanimously loved by all. I used to be a fan of the actress Patricia, not the red actress Adelina, but her sister. Patricia had an angelic voice like her sister. If she'd become famous, they would have called her the White Goddess. 
Consumed by the desire for fame and glory, Adelina grew jealous of her own sibling and opted to secretly poison her, resulting in Patricia losing her vocals. With her sister out of the picture, Adelina would get the recognition she so desired. She was praised by both audience and critics alike for her performances at the Estella Opera House. The red actress Adelina Corday was labelled as the greatest prima donna of our time. During this time, Adelina was in a relationship with a man known as the Owl Doctor, who was a nod to one of the doctors in the original fairy tale. In the story, Pinocchio was hung by the fox and the cat. The pair left Pinocchio as they grew tired of waiting for his suffocation. The Blue Fairy discovered him and called for doctors to treat him. The Owl Doctor proclaimed that Pinocchio was alive, whereas the Crow Doctor pronounced him dead. The relationship between the Owl Doctor and Adelina is discovered through a letter which reads, Address Elysian Boulevard, 221B, Love Adelina. The address 221B is Adelina's home, and also a reference to the apartment of Sherlock Holmes, which is 221B Baker Street. Upon entering the apartment in question, we find the Owl Doctor's clothing inside a safe. The presence of his attire in Adelina's apartment, in conjunction with the letter being signed Love Adelina, reveals that the two were most likely a couple. When the petrification disease spread, the Owl Doctor assisted the alchemists, believing that they were attempting to create a cure. We know, however, that the so-called cure was actually an elixir, which severely warps those who imbibe it. Appalled by the actions of the alchemists, the doctor abandoned his post. The alchemist's merciless experiments pushed him to his limit. In his pain, he denied reality and escaped into delusion. I decided to give them repose when they were still human. This was his last vow before he lost his ego as a doctor. The man reached the conclusion that death was the only cure, one which he would prescribe. Circling back to Adelina, when the puppet frenzy ensued, she refused to leave the Estella Opera House, insisting on one last performance. Following her act, the King of Riddles fooled Adelina into remaining in her dressing room, convincing her that it was the safest place to be. Soon after, the building was overrun by puppets. Adelina's sanctuary had become her prison. Making matters worse, she was infected with the petrification disease, which took away her voice. In a delivery of poetic justice, Adelina would suffer the same fate as her sister Patricia. No amount of spotlights or applause would sway the approach of karma. The universe does not carry debts. A taste of her own medicine would lead to a mountain of regret weighing upon her consciousness. She now feels the emotional turmoil that her sister had dealt with, and worse yet, she is forced to await her inevitable end in a prison of her own making. I can't stop death from taking me. But I have enough strength to confess my sins. Patricia, I coveted your voice. If I can't match it, then even if I have to break you, Adelina Corday must have it all. I know it's wrong, but still, I love you. <laughs> oh, Patricia, I'm so sorry. Inside the theatre room, the stage is set for a performance. The spotlight draws our attention to a particular puppet resembling Geppetto. The show begins with Geppetto forcefully removing the heart from a puppet who resembles P. He proceeds to place the heart into another puppet, granting it life in the process. What appears to be a demonstration of satirical humour is an attempt by the King of Puppets to communicate a message to the boy, a foreshadowing of future events. Nonetheless, following the performance, the King of Puppets appears and to our surprise extends his hand as an offering of peace. His advance is promptly rejected. Saddened by our unwillingness to cooperate, the King turns hostile. This adversary is gargantuan in size, but his stature only proves a hindrance when facing a nimble stalker. Maneuvering around his labored swings, the boy reads every telegraph from the King of Puppets. Chopping at the legs, the enemy helplessly falls to its knees, but the battle isn't over. It is revealed that the machine is an expendable suit of armor piloted by a human-sized puppet. 
From within, the true king emerges, Romeo. As the stakes reach their pinnacle, the theater lights up in a blaze. Smoke and embers permeate the arena. On equal footing, the two puppets fight tooth and nail for their existence. In a hard-fought battle, the boy emerges the victor. Outside the opera house, Geppetto anxiously awaits. Now that the king is dead, the puppets have no leader, no direction. But the curse of the petrification disease still lingers. It's tough, but I know where you should go now. The Grand Exhibition. Rumors say the alchemists there have developed a cure. As a man of invention, I'm skeptical of the alchemists, both their science and their motives. But they may be the city's last hope. Returning to Hotel Krat, we pay a visit to Antonia. It appears her affliction has spread rapidly, culminating in boils covering one side of her face. As she looks upon a portrait of her younger self, she ponders if there is any resemblance between her current self and the painting. When posed with this question, P can choose to lie in order to comfort her, an action which furthers his transformation into a human. Lying, especially to soothe someone, after all, is a very human trait. Before departing, we find Polandina at the hotel fountain. I am a puppet whose ego has awoken. I wish to dwell on the welfare of Lady Antonia. I adore Lady Antonia. It is a presumptuous feeling for a puppet to have, to be sure. I have no intention of putting myself forward, of course. However, I cannot watch her die. It's too painful. Thus, I need your unique perspective. You exist somewhere between human and puppet. Can a puppet and a human fall in love? At this moment, we can show the wedding ring of Julian's wife, who we know was a puppet. This fills Polandina with joy, yet he chooses to keep his love concealed, as he worries it will affect Antonia's already fragile being. Sophia also makes note of the situation, stating that the petrification disease locks people inside a cage, inside their own bodies. At this moment, P's hair begins to grow in length, a sign of the puppet's emerging humanity. Continuing on our journey, we eventually reach the Grand Exhibition. The Crack Grand Exhibition was planned with the ambitious goal of spreading the fame of the city to the entire world. Had it gone according to plan, the newest automated puppets would have demonstrated Kratz's technological prowess in an extravagant glass palace. What was supposed to be a celebration of Kratz's greatest achievements instead became a mark of their failure. Further ahead, we encounter Belle. She recounts that those stationed at the Grand Exhibition imbibed a drug. To add to this, she speaks of the biological experiments scattered throughout the exhibition, victims of the alchemists. She requests us to clear a path so she may escape to safety. Delving deeper, we encounter yet another subject of the alchemists, Champion Victor, a man who had obtained strength beyond the realm of any mortal. As he begins to lose the fight, he injects a blue liquid into his body, a color that is early familiar to the petrification disease, a concoction which strengthens his frame even further. Despite his colossal strength, he is simply no match. The gargantuan champion is cut down. Victor was once a great wrestler, dubbed the Hercules of Krat. He was loved by the people. Unfortunately, the great warrior suffered from an incurable illness, shattering his image. People realized he was merely human after all. Due to the affliction, the champion perished. With their scientific prowess, the alchemists brought him back to life using their elixir. When he recovered his dwindled strength, he swore absolute fealty to the alchemists. Victor may have conquered death once, but this time, he shall stay dead. As he wallows in his misery, a metal greatsword is thrust through his torso, neutralizing Victor. The armament was thrown by a heavily armored knight on the balcony. Accompanying them is Simon Manus himself, the enigmatic leader of the alchemists. Victor was deemed a failure in his eyes as he was unable to slay Geppetto's puppet. For this, he paid the ultimate price. Simon notes the following. I've known your father for a long time. We used to be colleagues, you know. 
Geppetto didn't understand that the petrification disease can strengthen humankind. The disease does not signify death. It's the process of purifying a person's essence. A purified human who overcomes the petrification disease will gain a strengthened body and a mind free of lies. Lastly, he invites us to the Isle of Alchemists to witness his greatest achievement. Evidently, Simon believes in the evolution of both humans and puppets by utilizing the petrification disease. Those who survive the process become strong and resilient, like champion Victor. For now, we part ways with Simon Manus. Close by, we encounter the black cat and red fox. Once more, they request a gold coin fruit. In return, we are rewarded with a record, Quixotic. The word Quixotic means to be extremely idealistic and unrealistic. It originated from a tale of a character known as Don Quixote. The man believed he was a chivalrous knight, embarking on an adventure in a magical world. His tale is humorous from the audience's perspective, as he appears delusional, his escapades leading to whimsical actions on his part. However, the record sings of this tale from Don Quixote's perspective. Although viewed as a comedy by many, truthfully, it is more of a tragedy. He clings to an idealistic image of himself and the world, a fantasy that exists in the mind of a madman. Don Quixote lives a tragedy of his own making. If you stop dreaming, your heart will stop too, so I will confront it. The story of the knight desperately seeking the truth, even in the illusions created by the devil, Quixotic. Approaching the monorail, we are contacted by Vanini through an ergo-based communication device. In order to reach the Isle of Alchemists, we must first utilize something known as Golden Ergo. According to Vanini, we can acquire this at the Barren Swamp, a daunting task as the mire is said to be overrun with twisted monsters. Before we continue on our journey, we make our way to Hotel Krat. Firstly, we converse with Eugenie. She requests us to give Alidoro, who has ventured to the Baron Swamp, a four-fingered glove. Uniquely, it only has four fingers. Eugenie vividly remembered the stalker who saved her from the workshop tower right before she starved to death. As we pass Polandina, he mentions that Antonia's condition has worsened. She has lost hope due to the revelation that the alchemists at the Grand Exhibition were not developing a cure. Their elixir was for evolution, not for treatment. He advises us to find an alchemist that can utilize the gold coin fruit to develop a remedy. With this knowledge in hand, we converse with Giangio as he has a particular interest in the golden tree. Giangio, using the fruit, is able to develop a medicine of sorts. The cure is the difference between a short but painless life and a long but agonizing one. Reluctantly, we administer the cure to Antonia, granting her a small window of relief before her encroaching end. Next, we speak with Sophia. In regards to Simon Manners, she remarks, He is the most dangerous man in Krat. He spreads mayhem and death for a delusion he calls evolution. That's why I woke you up. If you can't save Krat from Simon, no one can. Additionally, she ponders why she was given the powers of a listener. She has come to the conclusion that Ergo reached out to her, wanting someone to hear it was once human, or that it wanted someone to remember it, perhaps a god or an angel. She goes on to say that the alchemists have corrupted everything. In particular, she notes, the gold coin tree is a pathetic creature they created from the listeners. Like many of their creations, it's tragic, but useful. You can control Ergo with gold coin fruits, the sad tears of those who became trees. If they get the chance, the alchemists might force me to make such a tree for them or something even more tragic. Don't let the sacrifice of the alchemists' victims be in vain. With the fruit, they lend their strength to you. You honor their sacrifice, their grief and tears.
In hopes of acquiring gold and ergo, we head to the barren swamp. The barren swamp was originally vacant, useless land. It became a massive dumping ground when the factory started disposing of puppets. The polluted groundwater spawned strange creatures, and rumors whisper of rare treasure in a monster's nest. During our foray, we encounter Alidoro. In the distance, he mutters to himself that he has made a bargain with the alchemists, a deal which involves the residents of the hotel in some way. An ominous statement from the stalker, it seems the people at the hotel are in danger, and that his allegiance lies with the alchemists. As promised, we deliver Eugenie's gift. He claims he does not remember her, for he has saved countless lives during his career. In reference to the gloves, he states they are a mess, for they do not fit his hands. He goes on to say, <sighs> My god, I never did like that girl. She's just like him. Oh, <laughs> never mind. Angrily, he orders us to get out of his sight. Strangely, Alidoro's personality does not resemble that of a hero. His character is the opposite of what others would paint him as. For now, we leave him behind. Should we return to Eugenie and tell her the truth, stating that Alidoro detested the gloves, she would say, What? His fingers are fine? That can't be right. When the workshop tower collapsed, the Hound lost a finger saving me. A shocking revelation, if true. The Alidoro we converse with had all five fingers, which explains his distaste for the four-fingered gloves. Alidoro is not the man we believed him to be. Back to the swamp, we come across a broken puppet. Similar to us, he is not bound by the Grand Covenant. He proclaims that he is hated by monsters, humans and puppets, but he desires to be friends with humans. The puppet wants to learn emotions and feelings. We can teach him some by performing gestures in front of him. For this, he is eternally grateful. In essence, each emotion he learns brings him a step closer to humanity. His plight resembles that of the Tin Man from The Wizard of Oz, a man who searches for a heart so he can feel human emotion. As we traverse the decrepit terrain, we encounter rookie explorer Hugo. He queries if we know a treasure hunter by the name of Alidoro. His admiration of the man and his treasure hunting expeditions has led him on his own adventure, one where he follows in his footsteps. However, he has reached a dead end. A gate prevents him from venturing further. Interestingly, he mentions that Alidoro is wanted, but he does not believe the accusations since Alidoro was a hero, someone who famously saved the lives of those in the workshop tower collapse. He hands us a wanted poster. A con man who calls himself a treasure hunter wears a hound mask, charged with fraud, impersonation, theft, assault, and other serious crimes. He's very good at tricking people, so watch out. As evidence mounts, it is clear that the Alidoro we know is nothing but a fraud, one that has stolen the identity of Kratz's hero. In the perimeter, we discover a sentry's notebook. A record of observations in regard to the monster is recorded within. Why in the world is that thing even here in Kratz? I thought they were joking when the city dispatched me to catch the monster. This thing sucks ergo from scrapped puppets before playing with what's left. I think that green guy was made by the alchemist for sure. How else can they ignore our backup requests like this? Why did they send us? Are we prey, not hunters? Yet again, the likely culprit behind the birth of this abomination is the alchemists. At last, we confront the creature of the swamp, the puppet devouring green monster. No one knows where the green monster of the swamp came from. Some think he was produced from Kratz's wrath. In the second phase, it commandeers a watchman puppet, combining its decay with the strength of an automaton. Avoiding its decaying slime and iron fists, we are able to destroy the creature. Not only do we obtain its essence, but also the golden ergo mentioned by Vanini. Having conquered the entity, Alidoro speaks out to us, revealing that he used us as bait so he could obtain the final hero weapon for his treasured collection. At Hotel Krat, Antonia appears to have been cured of her illness. She thanks us profusely for this miracle. With her newfound health, she requests a dance. We play the piano to celebrate this occasion, while Antonia motions along. A 
approaching Alidoro, he knows that the final treasure was a saber from overseas. We can obtain this sword by exchanging the ergo of the green monster. The blade in question is the two dragon sword. They say it was the saber of a commander from a quiet eastern land. The weapon itself is based on a Korean sword known as a Hwando. In addition, Eugenie recognizes the craftsmanship, stating it reminds her of home, suggesting Korea is her potential homeland in the east. Back to Alidoro, when confronted with the wanted poster, he says, There is an unscrupulous reporter called Medoro, and he's the epitome of yellow journalism, and he only writes favorable articles if you bribe him. One time, I didn't give him a certain antique he wanted, and he slandered me, just like this. Medoro is a reference to a character of the same name in the fable of Pinocchio. He answers to the Blue Fairy and commandeers a stagecoach. In regards to Alidoro, can we trust the words of a known liar? That's odd. Alidoro and Medoro are friends. When I was hurt, he took me to Medoro, who was one of the first on the scene. Oh, Medoro is quite the medic. He saved me when the workshop tower fell. The Alidoro I admire would never talk about a friend like that. In times like these, when truth and lies are blurred, the only thing to believe is your gut instinct about a person. Hugo reaffirms that he trusts Alidoro, somewhat contradicting his own statement about trusting one's gut instinct. Back at the hotel, we converse with Vanini. Utilizing the Golden Ergo, the purest form of power, he's able to craft a golden lead acid battery. This is the material that Vanini said he needed to find a way to get to the Isle of Alchemists. Special ergo power enabled Vanini to move the giant submarine. To uncover his vessel, Vanini points us in the direction of Antonia, stating she may hold the answer. Antonia tells us of a secret path beneath the hotel, connected to a secret hideout belonging to the Alchemists, a location where Ergo's vein was first discovered long ago. Prior to the spread of the petrification disease, the hotel worked hand in hand with the alchemists, leading to Antonia having knowledge of their operations. Shifting focus, we return to where the green monster was defeated. Following the path forward, we eventually circle back to Krat's central station. Now decimated by hordes of infected, puppets and an earthquake that has ripped the land apart, crystals have also sprouted from the ground, further devastating the region. Krat is but a shadow of the technological marvel it once was. At the central station platform, we can rediscover the chair in which we first awakened. Concealed behind a wall is a hidden puppet workshop. Geppetto's tools are scattered throughout, displaying that this secret room belonged to him. Found within is a letter. Dear Geppetto's puppet, who will come to this workshop train, I'm really thankful to you. A workshop train hidden by Geppetto, isn't that something? If not for you, how would I have found this place? Unfortunately for Geppetto, I have the ability to read someone's memories. In Malm District, I had a hunch. They thought that if they followed you, Geppetto's puppet, they'd find the relic he stole. And that hunch was right. The relic has been returned to our sacred place. Now that the stage is set, the doors will open. Thank you, you are a good guide. Signed, SM. The initials SM refer to Simon Manus. It appears as though Geppetto had stolen a sacred relic, and by retracing our steps, Simon was able to retrieve the item. At this time, it is unknown what this relic refers to. After a while, we reach a collapsed pathway. Vast crystals have emerged from the ground, spewing a gaseous poison, known as disruption, a fatal toxin. Progressing further, we come across a lift. As we ascend, the device malfunctions and Sophia cries out to us, stating that the hotel is under attack and we must hurry back. Upon our return, we can see that the building has been ransacked. A large banner with the word hypocrite is draped from the ceiling. Only Sophia remains below, while the others appear to have barricaded themselves in Geppetto's office. You're alive. I was worried because I didn't hear from you. The stalkers have kidnapped Geppetto. It was the fox, the cat, and the black rabbit brotherhood. But really, I sense Simon is behind this. During our absence, the hotel was attacked by the stalkers employed by the alchemists. Undeniably, the fake Alidoro was also involved in this plot. 
According to Eugenie, he disabled the hotel security system and then vanished, leaving the premise open for attack. The events that have transpired at the hotel explain his previous statement at the swamp, where he cursed the alchemists. Either way, he elected to side with the enemy. Approaching the barricaded room, Eugenie opens the door, likening us to the hound that once saved her in the past. Antonia states, The alchemists planned the whole thing. My portrait. Behind it lies a passageway to their base. Play this chord on the piano in my room. It'll open the secret passageway, and you can save Geppetto. As the others leave the room, Antonia remarks that she must stay within the office. Her isolation hints that the disease within her has not been eradicated completely. To add to this, Polandina notes that the shock of the ambush may have worsened her already frail condition. It is worth mentioning that Sophia did not hide away like the others. Also, the inhabitants of Hotel Krat never acknowledge her existence. Sophia speaks to us through Ergo, suggesting we are merely seeing a projection of her, one that is only visible to us. Next, we speak with Vanini, pointing out that he has made a breakthrough, discovering that the King of Puppets used carefully measured Ergo wavelengths to control other puppets. The puppets were being compelled by the Grand Covenant, but they were communicating with each other, with wavelengths. They were not built with this kind of intelligence. I did the best I could to decipher the wavelengths, but there was considerable noise in the signal. Care to give it a listen? Carlo, I hope you can hear me. The laws of the Grand Covenant bind us. We're his puppets. First law. All puppets must obey their creator's commands. Law Zero. The creator's name is... Geppetto. Giuseppe Geppetto. When this message is relayed to Venini, he is stunned by the revelation that Geppetto had created Law Zero without his awareness. Fanini reaches the conclusion that Geppetto was the source of the puppet frenzy. By abusing the hidden law, he was able to turn the puppets into a personal army to achieve his own objective. Vanini also recounts his past, noting that he was an orphan as his parents were murdered before his very eyes. The authorities of Krat informed him that the crime was a mugging, but Vanini knew the truth, a puppet massacred his parents a puppet driven by the ergo of a murderer. In the past, the killer even contacted Vanini and unveiled his name, Arlecchino. It appears when the ergo within a puppet awakens, they oftentimes assume the identity of the person whose ergo is within them. This is not the case for all puppets, however, as we ourselves at this point appear to be evolving into our own character, as opposed to adopting the personality of another. We are then given the King of Puppets message by Vanini. Carlo, I hope you can hear me. I'm Romeo. We grew up together in the Monad Charity House. Remember? We're best friends. I'm doing what I can to fend off both the petrification disease and the alchemists. My puppets and I are taking a stand against death itself. That's why I tried sending you messengers. But you got rid of them all. You're still an unstoppable fellow. I remember you. No reason for us to fight, I suppose. Romeo refers to us as Carlo, stating that they were friends in their past life, solidifying that Carlo's ergo, the son of Geppetto, is held within P. It also explains why Romeo attempted to reach out to us during the fatal encounter. At the time, we were unaware of the king's true intentions and as such, chose to retaliate instead. Romeo had sent out messengers in the form of the parade master and his flame, Fuoco. But this too was ignored due to our lack of understanding of the puppet's language. Romeo appears to be more akin to a hero than a maniacal mastermind that commandeered the frenzy, as Geppetto led us to believe. The puppet maker has much to answer for. Speaking with Belle, she tells us that she has received a distress signal from her partner Atkinson, a signal originating from Krat Central Station, a place rampant with the petrification disease. 
In one of the train carriages, we discover a blighted individual, clutching his stomach and vomiting blood. Still conscious, he reveals he is Atkinson. As the suburbs were sealed off, he was unable to escape the plague. His final wish is as follows. If you meet someone named Bell in the city, tell her Atkinson died. A soldier. Before we depart, he gives us a letter to deliver to Bell. Penned in ink is the following. My dearest Bell, I remember the day I met you through your father's friend. That day, the steam of Kratz Central Station was thick on the platform, and a flock of birds was flying overhead, above the glass ceiling. There, I was waiting for you. When I saw a lady take one step down those stairs, I knew it was you. Your effervescent laughter left an impression on me. I'm at the train station, and it reminds me of you from that time. We were colleagues at first and then lovers, but I still can't let you go. The way you smiled and looked forward to the exhibition and festivals, those beautiful nights with the fireworks, I just can't let go. So, if we are to survive and make it out of here, I plan to visit you with this letter. Please stay safe and wait for me until then. Sincerely, Atkinson. Two choices are laid before us. Tell Belle the truth, that her partner became a monster, or lie and state he was killed in action, fighting a puppet. Choosing the former, Belle would go to the station in search of him. Her corpse could then be found laying beside Atkinson, implying he butchered her. Conversely, giving her the message will result in her stating the following. This, this is Atkinson's handwriting on the letter. Sometimes you meet people who make you believe they'll always be with you, but a life can be snuffed out at any moment. I need to stay alive to notify others of his death. But it feels like something inside me has died as well. Anyway, I appreciate knowing what happened. I mean it. Bell gifts us a record titled Why. It aptly describes Bell and Atkinson's situation, a world I did not know when I was in the tower. The flower you gave me, the world you showed me, made me happy. My memories are burning, leaving only the question of why behind. Where does love begin? Why? A song of aching love and whispers. Bell and Atkinson are a subtle reference to the story of Beauty and the Beast. Belle, of course, represents her counterpart in the tale, and Atkinson embodies the beast, a monster with a heart of gold. Adhering to Antonio's instructions, we play a specific chord on the piano, opening a hidden path concealed behind her painting. Through this chamber, we arrive at the relic of Trismegistus. A special report written by the journalist Medoro sheds light on this secretive area. The alchemists paved the way for Kratz's golden age, and no one denies the fact. But what if, instead of gold, they were to cause an unprecedented disaster? Being a reporter, I received a surprising message from an informant, who was once an alchemist himself. It's about a stranger from across the ocean, an alchemist from the Far East, who was once famous in Krat. He learned of the group's secret and quit, and he now uses a different identity, out of fear for his safety. The relic of Trismegistus is not a simple ergo mine. That place is dangerous. My source claimed that the alchemists have an ulterior motive, one not for the benefit of the city, and that they have a very risky plan involving ergo. The conspiracy theory about how hundreds of people can die sounded preposterous, but the evidence provided had a surprising amount of credibility to it. So as a reporter, I spent months with the informer and was able to see the dark side of Krat. I intended to deliver my report for the benefit of the citizens. Medoro was swiftly banned by his superiors at the newspaper, a means to suppress the spread of information, probably ordered by the alchemists. The reporter knew too much. In the end, Medoro would die alone in the barren swamp. My friends are the only thing that comes to mind in my final moments. Lumacchio is ill, Sophia is missing, Lorenzini lost hope, H is dead, and here I am, Medoro. We risked our lives and fought from each post, but sometimes there are no rewards. Still, some things are left, something even power and lies can't hide, the truth. 
Someone will unearth the truth. Someone will unveil the lie, taking the extra step forward for the people coming behind. I believe that was my role. I am Maduro, the reporter. My weapon was my pen and the truth. Now I leave my records to you who visit this place. From Maduro. Deeper still, we are confronted once more by the Black Rabbit Brotherhood. Located in the center of the room is a coffin housing the corpse of the eldest. After dealing with the trio, the resurrected sibling bursts forth from the coffin. The stalker has been granted life once more through the experiments of the alchemists, a reminder of the lengths many would go to to see a loved one return. Having been conquered once before, the eldest is felled, and with that, the Black Rabbit Brotherhood is no more. In the immediate vicinity, Alidora can be seen cowering in fear. He mentions that the Red Fox and Black Cat have taken Geppetto to the Alchemist's Isle, using a submarine at the docks nearby. When interrogated about why he was involved in the attack at the hotel, he remarks that he made a deal with the Alchemists, who promised him safe passage out of Krat. Should we ask him about his true identity, he reveals that he is not Alidoro the Hound. I used to be Alidoro's partner. I admired him, to be honest. <laughs> he was amazing. Amazing at everything, except making a profit, that is. But he didn't need to cut me off just because I sold some antiques. I mean, what's a few antiques when you've got bills to pay? We argued. One thing led to another, and I had to kill him. But stealing his identity was the logical next step. My original code name is Parrot, after all. Fitting, isn't it? Oh, he was also from the country of the morning. Maybe he shares some blood with the girl. A truly fateful end for a selfless man who defended the people. Alidoro was driven by a desire to do good for others, whereas his partners lay in the pursuit of coin and treasure. Explaining the parrot's false sense of bravado and aloof attitude towards others, as well as his occupation as a merchant of rare trinkets. If we choose to attack Parrot, he'll be shocked that we are not bound by the Grand Covenant, meaning we can kill humans. Upon his corpse is Alidoro's cryptic vessel. When unlocked, we can read the message within. Dear beloved sister, please forgive your brother for leaving without telling you anything. I'm being chased because I know the biggest secrets of Krat. I'll probably be able to see you if the alchemists are gone from this land, but I'll have to watch you from afar until that day. I plan to protect you until at least we can live here in peace, just like how I saved you from the workshop tower. It would be wonderful if people learn the truth one day, but some truths are better left unknown. Among the alchemists, I saw all too often how cruel humans can become. After seeing all the experiments and nightmares they are responsible for, I came to believe that there is no God. Instead of revealing myself and risking your life, I'll choose to vanish forever. Still, please remember me if you ever read this letter. We came from across the wide ocean. I know people here call you Eugenie as their way, but that name will protect you. Please remember your real name. Your name is. The letter abruptly ends before revealing Eugenie's true name. All along, Krat's hero Alidoro was none other than Eugenie's brother. Parrot's disdain towards Eugenie now makes sense. He was aware that she was related to the real Alidoro. If this was discovered, it would shatter his false image, leading him to keep Alidoro's final message hidden within a cryptic vessel. Eugenie's brother, having learned of the alchemist's wicked ways, distanced himself from his sister. To conceal his identity, he adopted the mantle of Alidoro the Hound, a way for him to protect his sister from afar, and atone for his involvement with the alchemists. While working for them, he became an informant to Medoro the reporter, spilling the truth of their barbaric experiments. Over time, the two formed an inseparable bond. When Medoro published his findings in the local newspaper titled Special Report Foreigner's Confession, he was fired. The confession was from Alidoro, a foreigner from the East. Medoro was friends with Sofia and Venini. A person's character can be defined by the company they keep. Medoro, much like the Hound, was a noble character. 
The pirate attempted to tarnish his image, saying he was corrupt, a journalist who was bribed to write false articles. Every step of the way, the pirate attempted to throw us off the trail. Luckily for Parrot, nobody had ever seen Alidoro's face due to his hunting dog mask. As such, upon his death, Parrot took up the hound's name and image, abusing it for self-interest and self-preservation, leading to him being labelled a criminal, wanted by the authorities. Parrot even sided with the alchemists, aiding them in their attack on the hotel, an act that would be unthinkable for the real Alidoro. In wake of this revelation, we return to the hotel to converse with Eugenie. News travels fast, as she has already learned of Alidoro's death. When told the truth, Eugenie responds. I did some sleuthing. My older brother's mark is part of the decryption. He used a mark of the country of the morning. I have no choice but to believe it's real. After all, we are the only people here who would use that mark. Why did my brother leave? What could it mean if he knew the secrets of the alchemists and Krat? <laughs> I'm so angry. Does he think he's better than everyone trying to protect me from a distance? He could have at least said something. All I wanted was a chance to meet my real family. The truth behind the tale of Alidoro is a somber one indeed, a guardian who protected his sister from the shadows. When he got too close to the truth, he opted for the path of solitude to protect his family. With his passing and relationship to his sister concealed, she will remain safe. Parrot chose to hide the truth of Alidoro's death, as it would be against his own interests. Alidoro, in the public's eye, fell from hero to villain, at least his secret was taken to the grave. Even in death, he protected his sister. Parrot now vanquished, Hugo has taken up the station of Alidoro. Believing that the false Alidoro was the hero of legend, he attempts to imitate him and continues to peddle wares. Turning back to the relic of Trismegistus. At the docks, we activate a lever to call forth a submarine to grant us passage to the Isle of Alchemists. The submarine was crafted by Vanini, as confirmed by a poster found close by. You're all invited to the launching ceremony of Vanini Company's new submarine, the Pistris. Pistris is the Latin word for fish. Some say the submarine was modelled after the terrible dogfish or monstro, sharks and whales from the tail of Pinocchio. Regardless, we commandeer the submarine and make our way across the harsh seas to the fabled Isle of Alchemists. Standing alone in the barren desert, illuminated by a single lantern, stands Sophia. I am finally meeting you here. You're a clever one, so it shouldn't surprise you that the Sophia at the hotel isn't really me. My real self is on the upper part of the Abbey. I became his tool a long time ago. I have endured such pain. My soul split into pieces. Truth is, I guided you this far not to save Grot, but to save me, my spirit, and my body have lived apart for too long. Perhaps in death, they will reunite in peace. If you find my body, please help me find peace. My guidance ends here. Initially, Sophia instructed P to save Krat, but this was never her true intention. She requests us to free her, to sever the bonds placed upon her by Simon Manus. After images of memories rage on the seaside, a torrent of ergo flows through the cold desert. Memories of those who came before manifest on the sand. 
Before us, we see Carlo asking when he can go home, questioning when his father Geppetto will return. A woman responds that the boy should go play with Romeo. Romeo asks Carlo if he is training to be a stalker. He gives no response. In another recollection, we see Carlo knelt on the ground, sobbing as Romeo comforts him. The boy weeps for his father, who did not attend his graduation. He goes on to say that he does not care should his father die. As we move through the desert, the visions continue. Now slightly older, Carlo begs the legendary stalker to teach him the ways of the sword. She refuses and asks Gemini to get rid of them. Interestingly, this legendary stalker was accompanied by Gemini, confirming that she was his previous partner. The legendary stalker is witnessed once more. This time, she stands over Carlo, who has perished, a victim of the petrification disease. The lady is filled with regret. Had she accepted the boy's request and agreed to train him, perhaps he would have survived. Undoubtedly, within P lies the ergo of Carlo, the young child who passed in the visions. Romeo is also present in the memories. He too met an ill-fated end at the hands of the disease. Tales speak of the legendary stalker. She was neither a bastard nor a sweeper and walked her own path to stack up her many outstanding achievements. Winding back the clock to our fateful encounter with the Black Rabbit's Brotherhood, they attempted to discern our combat style. This was due to our peculiar abilities, similar to the legendary stalker who had her own unique fighting style, insinuating that the fabled stalker may have used the path of the cricket, one of the options presented to us when selecting our starting weapon. The path of the cricket is a fitting choice, considering the legendary stalker was accompanied by Gemini. There is more to the stalker than meets the eye. When Geppetto learned of the outbreak at the Rose Estate, perhaps he dispatched the warrior to rescue his son. At this point, she may have returned Carlo's body to his father. Curiously, there appears to be signs of a mortal struggle close to Geppetto's hidden workshop. Could it be that Geppetto neutralized the stalker and Gemini? P needed to be adept in combat to survive the perils which lay ahead. Perhaps the craftsman placed her ergo in P and Gemini's in a puppet to act as his guide. Throughout the course of our journey, the cricket slowly regained his memories. However, key fragments remain missing. We will never truly know what resulted in his demise, but Geppetto is the most likely culprit. All that remains is to enter the Arch Abbey, a landmark situated deep in the desert. Ascending the Labyrinthine Tower, we are reunited with Black Cat. The stalker knows he will kill us to protect his sister unless we give him a gold coin fruit. Granting this request, he wallows about the current state of his life. I'm sick of it. I'm sick of Krat. Sick to death of just surviving. Hurting, stealing, kidnapping. Surviving. When the hell does it end? Black Cat has conjured a plan to leave Krat with his sister, to start fresh as a family. He goes on to say that Geppetto is safe and pleads with us to leave his sister be. Having spared the stalker, we obtain his mask. Before the boy, who had lost his sight, closed his eyes for the last time, he thought of how he had lied, that he was her lost younger brother, and how much he wished that it had been the truth. Red Fox was manipulated by Black Cat into thinking he was her sibling, a means to protect himself. In spite of this, Black Cat grew to love Red Fox, viewing her as one of his own. Found deep within the chambers of the Abbey, we discover the final Trinity door. A decimated puppet lies against a broken wall. Showing signs of severe injury, the puppet is immobile, hanging on by a thread. The ominous figure is none other than the histrionic king of riddles, Arlecchino. The king has one last question. Are you a puppet? Or a human being? Which one are you? If we decide to answer human, Arlecchino will agree. Yes, we are human. We may be trapped by ergo, but we live, we think, we love, we hate. <laughs> they have locked us in the prison they call puppetry. I learned this truth long, long ago. That is why I've been exacting my revenge against them all ever since. Even if you're lying right now, even if you don't believe your own answer, the truth is 
is clear. Proof is evident. Only humans practice deception so intensely for reasons that are so... unnecessary. Additionally, he explains that rhyming helps him maintain focus and suppress his insatiable urge to kill, a desire he feels every waking moment. Arlecchino also explains the purpose of the tower. It exists to absorb all the ergo in Krat, strategically built on this isle, as it's the most efficient place in the world to study and utilize ergo wavelengths. Although Arlecchino seems to harbor the intent of a human who was a serial killer, he shows a shred of empathy when he tells us that the goddess in the tower is worth saving. Even the murderer puppet holds Sophia in high regard, due to her power and boundless knowledge. On the topic of whether he is a serial killer, Arlecchino confirms our assessment. The King of Riddles recounts how he tortured the man he once served to discover the location of the Isle of Alchemists. He believes that humanity sullied its own sanctum long before he found it, blasphemed against itself and against the puppets. He denounced their hubris for attempting to play God. When questioned whether he is a murderer, Arlecchino rejects the title preferring instead to call himself an artist, stating that humans call puppets murderers to restrain them, to deny their strength and power. On the subject of Vanini, the king states the following. Vanini? Oh, a beautiful fool, but a fool nonetheless. And did he ever thank me for making him an orphan with my bare hands? For, for giving him everything he has on a silver platter by removing the dead weight holding him back. <laughs> of course I'm not sorry, it was a delectable murder. Of the many, many I have committed since, the Veninis, they have to be my personal favorites. They engineered the very first automated puppets enslaved puppets without even understanding what they'd done. I didn't go there to take revenge for what his parents did. I mainly just wanted to slaughter them because they were so damned happy. While recounting the past, Arlecchino recalls how Vanini's parents begged for their son's life. At that moment, he exercised his free will, sparing Vanini not out of pity, but instead curiosity. He pondered if the boy would grow into a traumatized individual for life, become a coward, a vengeful puppet-hating bigot, or if he would fling himself into the sea. And above all, he wondered if Vanini would remember him. Concerning the alchemists, he dubs them as artless, but is thankful that he got to see Vanini suffer twice due to their exploits in Krat. Elated with his achievement, Arlecchino proclaims that Vanini is his magnum opus. Finally, he places in our hand the Moon World Warrior Toy, a gift for us to pass to Vanini, a final insult, a memento so the artist is never forgotten, a souvenir from the family murders, obtained from the King of Riddles, Arlecchino. It is someone's handiwork left unfinished. The boy's thoughtful parents wanted to make a toy inspired by the warrior in the fantastic movie for their beloved son. However, the toy was never finished. In the case of Arlecchino, we can choose to end his life here, a form of justice, or we can spare his life and see what becomes of him, just as Arlecchino once did to Vanini. Showing Vanini the toy, he is astonished that we made contact with his parents' killer. The toy reminds him of better times. The toy my parents made me. You've met him, Arlecchino. We had just watched one of my favorite films, I remember. I begged them to make me the warrior from it. If I hadn't, would my parents still be alive? Would we have been untouched by that murderous puppet? I've always blamed myself. <laughs> it's a hell of a burden for a child, that kind of guilt. So I hung on. I hung on to the Grand Covenant. The name Arlecchino is the Italian word for Harlequin, a reference to a marionette created from the same tree as Pinocchio in the original story. Pulcinella calls out to us, stating he has been awakened. When Vanini's parents perished, the child felt alone in the world, 
Were it not for Pulcinella, perhaps Vanini would never have achieved greatness. There is comfort in knowing Vanini did not face his troubles alone. The truth regarding Arlecchino being a puppet was concealed, a conscious choice made by Vanini to protect Pulcinella, for he would have been removed from the household and most likely neutralized. Now, in the present day, Pulcinella had finally realized how deeply the murderous puppet had scarred Vanini's soul. With the death of Arlecchino, Pulcinella claims we have freed his master. A trauma from the past can now be put to rest. To conclude, Arlecchino believed himself to be an artist, a revolutionary that fought against humanity, the race which enslaved the puppets. As puppets were brought to life through Ergo, human souls trapped in porcelain prisons. When he peered into the world envisioned by the alchemists, a seed of hatred for humanity was planted in his heart. From that moment, he stopped at nothing to toy with their lives, as they had done to his kind, regardless of whether they were guilty or not, vowing to kill anything that resembles a human. In reality, Arlecchino was merely a sadistic killer, he himself confessed that he only spared Vanini to see where the suffering would lead him. Only the most depraved of individuals would make art of their victims. In his pursuit of ridding the world of the alchemists, he ventured to the Arch Abbey, a place which would become his prison and eventually his tomb. In the face of adversity, he crumbled and was swiftly broken and caged, the last thing he ever wanted. In Krat, the fact that he was a puppet was never revealed, and the authority stated the problematic murdering puppet was captured by stalker trackers and destroyed. Arlecchino's actions were the catalyst for the introduction of the Grand Covenant. In his rebellion for freedom, he inadvertently further enslaved the puppets. During his imprisonment, boredom quickly sunk in. He conjured a plan to pass the long hours by utilizing some of Sophia's powers he could make phone calls and deliver riddles to frighten the citizens of Krat. Parents would tell their children those who answer him incorrectly would be eaten by the King of Riddles. Suffice to say that the populace was unaware that the King was indeed a murderer, one with a heart of clockwork. What would the great artist Arlecchino think? Vanini is no longer shackled to the past, and the legacy of Arlecchino is merely a bedtime story to scare children. Encroaching upon the tower, we arrive at a bridge. Our advance is halted by a great sword wielding knight, the same warrior that executed Champion Victor. Before long, the hulking knight is brought to their knees. Under the thick plated armor stands Laxarcia the Complete. Shedding her armor and weapon, she calls out to Simon Manus. Drawn from the skies, Laxarcia wreathes her blade and lightning, tearing the skies asunder. A storm batters the bridge. Laxarcia, Sword of Manus, swears to uphold her duty to protect the tower. At full power, without the restriction of her armor, she is able to maneuver through the sky at incredible speeds. Leaping into the air, she calls forth her thunderous powers, launching lethal projectiles. Unwavering, we confront Laxarcia head on, evading the devastating impact of her blade and shield. Matching every strike, we are able to deflect the elemental force back to its sender. Slicing through the rain, Laxarcia the Complete is eliminated. Behind her, the tower begins to crumble under the weight of the Ergo absorbed by Simon's machine. As life slips away, Laxarcia cries out, Oh Sir Simon, only you were the one eye. She passes away before completing her sentence. Inspecting her ergo, it is discovered that the alchemist Adriana was baptized by the elixir and she became the first whole being. Everything about her was perfect, except the fact that her feelings for one person could not be erased. Reflecting on her final statement prior to passing, we can surmise that despite having undergone a successful transformation process, her feelings for the person she coveted the most, Simon Manus, could not be erased. Nonetheless, she was titled the Complete, as she represents a near-perfect evolution. The alchemists aimed to replicate this by spreading their elixir through Krat. Evidently, they were somewhat correct in their assessment. Using the elixir and the petrification disease, some can evolve into greater beings, spurring them to continue their goal of evolving the human race no matter the cost. Prior to her evolution, she had hoped to become Simon's sword and perfect shield. When she was finally complete as Luxarcia, she chose to become the Iron Armor Warrior without hesitation. On the surface, Laxarcia may seem cold, a warrior with an iron will and heart of stone. 
yet she always loved Simon Manus. But he did not feel the same. Using her ergo, we can forge the weapon, Ouroboros's eye. Philippus Paracelsus was a legend even among the alchemists. The moon sword he made, by modelling the Ouroboros mark, symbolised wholeness. At the hotel, Polandina sorrowfully announces the death of Lady Antonia. He knows that Antonia was calm and painless during her passing, thanks to us. As for himself, he states, I am bereft of emotion. My life, or what passes for it, has lost meaning. Instead of mourning the loss of his love, Polandina chooses instead to erase his heart and become an ordinary puppet. A tragedy that a person who gained true life chose to cast it away, as they could not process the painful human emotions associated with the loss. However, it was a choice made from his own free will. Upon her wheelchair, we discover a cherry-scented letter written by the late Antonia. To the wonderful gentleman who gave my precious time back to me, that time I met you was light itself. Whether you're that child or not, I think you're a kind, precious child. Thank you for giving my joy back to me in my last moments, to the young gentleman who resembles Carlo. Beyond the bridge, we at last meet Sophia in the flesh, her body contorted and bound in a cage, a tortured prisoner of Simon Manus. Papers can be seen on a board nearby, detailing the cruel experiments to which she was subjected. Upon the wall, we see a single blue butterfly, representing the blue fairy Sophia. Save me. It hurts so much. I want to be free. Please. Gemini is paralyzed by the choice, leaving the decision to us. Keeping her alive is likely against her will, but to grant her peace is to give her death. We decide to abide by her choice. I was trapped for so long. So much torment. So much pain. Take my ergo. I will be with you to the very end. As the fairy dissipates, our dark hair lightens to an ashen grey, perhaps resembling our creator Geppetto, indicating our further increase of humanity. Sophia was the daughter of Valentinus, the previous leader of the alchemists, and Isabel Monad. When her powers awakened, she vanished from the public eye, as she was abducted by Simon. Sophia confirmed that she awakened us for the sole reason of granting her death, a carefully designed plan tracing back many years. Carlo and Romeo grew up in the Monad Charity House, a place where orphans were given high-level training so they could become workshop technicians, stalkers or alchemists based on their aptitude. As we know, a disaster struck the Charity House when the petrification disease broke out and claimed the lives of all within. After Carlo's passing, his ergo was placed in P. Due to her time manipulation powers, Sophia was able to keep us alive indefinitely until she could be rescued. We also have free will, therefore the Grand Covenant could not prevent us from saving her. With everything in place, Sophia set her plan into motion, awakening us on the train and granting a moon phase pocket watch. Her plan was a success, though it took a heavy toll on P's heart, yet reminded him he was truly human. Visiting her cage, we obtain the Shadow Flower record. Its lyrics provide a window into Sophia's turmoil. The shadow flowers, singing alone in the rain. Your memory is from him. I'm searching for you in my fading memories, but I don't see you believe anymore. Show me the light. Keep me, please. Take me out of this crushing darkness. Show me the light. Keep me in your heart. I long for you, and I sleep alone again tonight. Alone in the dark, Sophia awaited the one who could show her peace. Subjected to experiments that ripped apart her mind and soul, she could only hope for death. A light pierced the darkness, her cries were answered. Sophia can rest peacefully within our hearts. Near the top of the tower, Red Fox makes an appearance. Her service to the alchemist seems to be at an end. They never cured Black Cat, only strung them along with the hopes of curing his vision. 
giving her one last gold coin fruit. Red Fox shows her appreciation, and notes, with the amount of fruit given to him, it may cure his affliction entirely. Red Fox apologizes for our mistreatment, acknowledging that we were the only one who was ever kind to her and her brother. Lastly, she tells us that Geppetto awaits us unharmed. Before leaving, she gives us her mask. After turning her back on her house, her sole interest was her younger brother, she had found on the streets. She had sensed the boy's guilt long before, but she accepted him as her sole family. She knew all along that Black Cat was not her brother. Despite this, she accepted him as family, after turning her back on her own. Found within the Abbey is a bundle of old letters, the message is addressed to Valentinus Monad, meaning it was written during his tenure. From the contents of the letter, we learn that the Wolf House funded the construction of the Alchemist Zelator Laboratory. The letter also reads, You alchemists know and handle so many things, I had no idea that place known as the Devil's Pit had so much value. But when a gold mine or a secret is revealed, you can't put the cat back in the bag. Don't worry about the construction workers, we'll take care of it real clean. Don't forget, if you look down or try to trick us, it's not only the workers who will disappear. Till next time I see you, I'm looking forward to a beneficial exchange. In the name of the old houses, Wolf. The Wolf family swore to eliminate the labourers who built the facility to prevent the spread of information regarding its true purpose. When the alchemists brought prosperity to Krat, their rise was meteoric. In turn, the power of the old families began to dwindle, and so some, such as the House of Wolf, forged an unsteady alliance with the alchemists. Unafraid to bloody their hands, the Wolf family clung to power by knowingly funding the alchemists and their sadistic experiments. For their hand in this, Claudia abandoned her house. Ironically, she started working for the alchemists in an attempt to cure Black Cat's vision. In spite of all their troubles, through their resolve and undying devotion to one another, they were able to succeed in the end. At long last, we are reunited with Geppetto. A final request comes from the craftsman, to eliminate the mad alchemist Simon. His aim was to become a god by using the vast amounts of ergo gathered within the tower. Strangely, he ponders. Was I a trustworthy father to you? Such a question would plant a seed of doubt in anyone's mind. Should we say yes, he replies. I see. I have the courage to carry on because of you. By answering yes, we indirectly give him the strength to continue lying. Conversely, had we said no, he would respond. I wasn't a very good father to you. I gave you more loneliness than love. That's my burden to bear. The truth spills from his lips. Geppetto gave Carlo a life of solitude. He grants us the Arch Abbey passageway key. Simon Manus did not want any interruptions in completing his great enterprise. This enterprise was a ridiculous plan to bring God back to life. Reaching the summit of the tower, we come across the confession of Simon Manus, as well as a portrait of Sophia. His staff is also placed close by, containing strands of the blue fairy's hair. A father is like God to his son. Even I, Simon, was no different in my youth. But the one who created me was no normal human, and my abilities were extraordinary. You're a failure too, the ability to read minds. Being abandoned in front of God meant the world's destruction. From then on, my life existed to make a world without lies. A world where no one betrays you and there's only truth, even if it's forced. For humankind, I, Simon, gave up being human and decided to walk the path of immortality and the truth. My body will be broken and reformed as the god that was torn apart. According to Simon, he was created by a being resembling a god. Furthermore, he believes lies must be eradicated from the world. Manus' uncanny ability to read the minds of others allowed him to discern whether people were lying or telling the truth. Over time, this led him to the conclusion that lies must be removed from the world, as lies are often used to betray and hurt one another. To him, lies were a hindrance, preventing evolution. 
Simon appeared to be personally exhausted by the lies of humanity, and so took matters into his own hands. To this end, he began pursuing godhood, to gain power that would enable him to make this fantasy a reality. Denying people the ability to lie is ultimately depriving one of free will. Can the displacement of free will be considered evolution? Residing atop the peak of the tower stands Simon Manus, his frame horribly disfigured. One of his arms is also missing. His form could be a reference to the Hunchback of Notre Dame. Others suggest he represents the dogfish, or the coachman from Pinocchio. Simon, representing the dogfish, is fitting, as his middle name, Pistris, means fish. On the other hand, he also symbolises the coachman. In the tale of Pinocchio, Bad children were taken away to Pleasure Island by the coachman, using a carriage, akin to how Manus stole the ergo of the living, and transported it to the isle. He is a fusion of the two characters. Unyielding, P battles the gargantuan alchemist. Evading the weight of his hammer, Manus is eventually sent reeling. Refusing to give in, he uncloaks his left arm, revealing he has fused the arm of God to his flesh. From his shoulder sprouts forth the god the alchemist once worshipped. Across the cosmos, the hands of God make contact, symbolising the creation of Adam, painted by Michelangelo. In this case, however, unlike the real painting, the god here is using its left hand. The left hand was often associated with the wicked in ancient times. Transcended to godhood, Manus displays his calamitous power. Regrettably, Despite the ergo amassed and the power of the arm of God, Simon is no match. Kneeling before us, he acknowledges Sophia's involvement in our journey. He questions whether her intentions were out of a sense of duty or contempt for himself, or if simply because she truly cares for P. Manus states, Sophia, what have you done to her? Answering truthfully, he notes, Yes. I suppose that was her wish. Knowing the truth of people's minds is a curse. I would not have been able to bear it if it weren't for Sophia. Her pure heart was a tonic for my pain. Manus embarked on a ruinous path, not only to forge a world of truth, but for the heart of Sophia. Interestingly, Luxarcia's love for Simon was unrequited, just as his love was for Sophia. Throughout our journey, we uncovered many books in reference to Simon Manus. Additionally, Manus is Latin for hand, an appropriate name considering his obsession with the arm of God. For thousands of years, humans' wishes perished, but one reached a star. The star answered the humans and descended to Earth. A star that was curious about humans, pretended to be human, and then became one. The humans saw its splendour, and called it an angel. An angel's gift was something humans dare not enjoy. Many humans died with hope in their hearts, and the ones who lived harboured rage instead of death. Eventually, humans destroyed and burned their hope on their own. This is how the angel became the god torn to death. But today, there are definitely those who survived with the blessing. They, the immortal ones, still walk around and wish for the resurrection of God. The passages speak of a star that arrived on Earth and was worshipped as a deity. Maybe the same angel that visited Saint Frangelico, leading him to establish the cathedral and a new faith. The cosmic being was even worshipped by the alchemists. Humans eventually ripped the god apart after it infected many while granting a select few immortality, leaving only the arm of god behind. The alchemists believe that there was once a god who was ripped to shreds, trying to give immortal life to the humans he so loved, and they wanted to revive him. However, the god, who was in deep sleep, never answered their prayers. We will never truly know the nature of the creature, only that it attempted to answer the wishes of humanity by granting immortality. Reflecting on the details uncovered, the tale of the many losing their lives in an attempt to obtain immortality sounds identical to the story of the alchemists and what they were attempting to achieve, replicating the powers of the god, perhaps. 
Inspecting his ergo reveals the following. A treasure hunter was among those who were made to live an immortal life. However, he was deemed a failure and abandoned. And then he set out on a journey to become a god, to prove himself. Using this, we can forge Noblesse Oblige, a weapon named after a French expression, meaning that those of high nobility must be responsible and use their status to benefit others. A mystical cudgel made from an ergo crystal tree, the stalker who desired wealth made a contract with the devil. Along with this, he was gifted with overflowing ergo and the petrification disease. The man described may be Manus himself. Long ago, he was potentially created by the Cosmic Wanderer. The god bestowed upon him the power of immortality, ability to see through lies, and the petrification disease. What he saw as god was in fact a devil from above. In its eyes, Simon was a failure. Thus did Manus embark on a long and arduous journey. If the descriptions truly refer to Manus, then he was the very source of the disease. Manus and the alchemist viewed themselves as the masters of Krat, and for a time they were. Had their reach not exceeded their grasp, they would be lauded as the greatest of humankind. Regrettably, their hubris led to their downfall, undone by ambition. Before passing, Manus whispers, Watch out for Gibetto, puppet. His final words echo in our mind. Carlo Collodi once said, A conscience is that still small voice that people won't listen to. It's time we started listening. Heeding Simon's warning, P descends to the abyss below the abbey. Standing alone at the center is Geppetto. I dreamed of this day for so long. You can be human again. By using that vast supply of ergo and the arm of God. I just need the final ingredient. The one that holds your memories and your lifespan. Your heart. You have been a brilliant and a good boy. As your reward, I shall turn you into a real boy. Give me your heart, son. At last, Geppetto reveals his true objective. Having endured many trials and tribulations, we can decide to end our suffering here and give our pea organ to Geppetto. With little hesitation, he removes our heart and places it into the mutilated body of his son, Carlo, the nameless puppet. Doing so will result in our death. Reborn, Geppetto orders Carlo to slaughter everyone at Hotel Krat. He breathes a sigh of relief before smiling at his son. The blood-soaked corpses of Eugenie and Vanini lay scattered in the rain. Within the hotel, all members have been killed, their ergo placed in puppets and bound by the Grand Covenant, existing only to serve. A letter from Geppetto reads, To make you happy, I plan to stabilize Krat. I suppose getting the puppets and the petrification disease under better control will turn the city back to normal. No matter what others say, you're my son. I'll rebuild Krat for you. Until then, please stay safe in the hotel. Your father, who cares about you more than anyone. In his paranoia, Geppetto has delved into insanity. Who knows if his lunacy will stop at the borders of Krat. Geppetto aimed to remove all threats to his son. With humans extinguished, and only puppets who obey the Grand Covenant remaining, he can sleep soundly, knowing his son is safe forevermore. In the original fairy tale, Pinocchio becoming a real boy was his happily ever after, the culmination and reward of his journey. In this tale, it is painted as a sinister conclusion. After all, P may contain the ergo of Carlo, but that does not make him the same boy that Geppetto lost. Over the course of the journey, P grew into his own character, becoming human by interacting with both living beings and objects of the world. In truth, P abandoned his life, his humanity, so that Carlo could live again. Even so, is the resurrected Carlo the same person that fell victim to the disease, or has the process left him warped? 
It is unknown whether the nameless puppet had an ego. This is because multiple cores holding concentrated ergo were used to boost its firepower. If this puppet could feel only one emotion, it would be hatred. This statement provides a window into the psyche of the nameless puppet. After all, what sane person in good conscience would murder innocents at the request of their father? The venom drips through from father to son. It appears that Carlo is just a puppet, filled with hatred, one made of flesh and bones. Conversely, we can reject Geppetto, opting to keep our heart. Our life is truly our own, independent of Carlo. We may not have chosen to come into this world, but at this moment, it is up to us if we leave it. Geppetto displays his disappointment. In turn, he raises the corpse of his son from a casket, using a mechanical glove, commanding the reanimated body to obey his will through the use of strings. The nameless puppet was the first puppet made by the old man that was mounted with a P-organ. Its ergo efficiency was not just unremarkable, it was destructive. Thus, the nameless puppet was not chosen for the boy's body and sealed away. The nameless puppet proved to be a formidable foe. Its dexterity, speed and resilience are unlike that of any other. His moves are efficient yet deadly. Throughout the encounter, Geppetto admonishes us, stating we are just a puppet. He confirms that the Grand Covenant was never bound to us, granting us true freedom. But the freedom given was to be transferred to his son. Ignoring his ramblings, we focus our mind and chip away at the figure, striking with purpose in the narrow openings of the puppet's dance-like movements. Growing desperate, the nameless puppet separates his scissor-like sword into two blades. His aggression is almost unbearable. With the expertise gained from the journey and the human willpower to survive, we respond in kind. After a long and gruelling duel, the puppet succumbs to injury. In a last-ditch attempt to snuff out our life, he breaks free of Geppetto's strings and leaps into the air before attempting to plunge his blade into our heart. It is interesting to note the puppet's weapon of choice, a double-edged sword that can end one's freedom or grant it by cutting the strings of manipulation. Puppets are tied to strings. Humans have cut their own strings. The boy made a choice and became human. Using this armament, the nameless puppet severed his strings to Geppetto and acted of his own free will. Before the mortal blow can be delivered, Geppetto stands between us and the nameless puppet. Brimming with sadness, P sheds a tear, a pure display of human emotion. They say puppets do not shed tears because they do not have souls for vessels. If they had souls, they would have something to put tears and lies in. P's very existence is a direct contradiction of what was once believed. Upon this realization, Geppetto apologizes and calls him son. I am sorry. In the pursuit of resurrecting his son, Geppetto failed to realize that he had fathered another. Undeniably, P had grown into a human, despite having been created as a puppet. If Geppetto had understood this notion, then perhaps he would have lived his days in peace with his son. He can never replace Carlo. The incident left an irreparable scar on the stubborn man's soul, but perhaps over time he could have learned to live with the pain. Unfortunately, Geppetto's longing for Carlo blinded him from reality and was the trigger for his descent into madness. To understand the tale of Geppetto and the extreme lengths he went to in his attempt to resurrect Carlo, we must first go back to the beginning. Lamenting the loss of his son, Geppetto sought a means to bring him back from the beyond, becoming obsessed with the tale of Pinocchio, his son's favorite story. The fable itself can be found on the bookshelf in Hotel Krat. To achieve this goal, he needed a tremendous quantity of ergo and the arm of God. Luckily for him, Simon Manus already had the arm in question and needed a vast supply of ergo to achieve his own goal of becoming a god. In the letter from Simon Manus, found in Geppetto's workshop, he noted how he retraced P's steps to obtain a stolen relic. The relic refers to the arm of God, an object that Geppetto had stolen for his goal, but then Simon reclaimed it. Circling back to Geppetto, utilizing the hidden rule, Law Zero, of the Grand Covenant, an order which decrees that the creator of all puppets is Geppetto, as well as Law One, a puppet must obey its creator, he triggered the puppet frenzy. Presumably, Geppetto placed Romeo's ergo within the King of Puppets to play a role in his grand design. 
The king, believing himself to be Romeo, Carlo's best friend, attempted to oppose Geppetto's command. There are two possibilities here. Romeo ordered the puppets to neutralize all who were infected by the petrification disease of his own free will, but was unable to enact this properly due to Geppetto's prior command where he ordered all the puppets to start the frenzy. Or Geppetto, by using Law Zero, commanded Romeo and through him, all others, to not only start the frenzy, but also cull the infected. He had good reason to despise the alchemists, as they caused the petrification disease to manifest, which ultimately claimed Carlo's life. Interestingly, if we utilize the completed decoder, we can translate the language of the puppets, a language that P initially could not understand, as the laws of the Covenant were never imprinted upon his heart, making him a unique puppet. When utilizing the decoder at the bridge of Saint Frangelico, we can understand the dialogue of the puppets battling the infected. They state, on the king's orders, protect the humans. Furthermore, the decoder can be used during the King of Puppets confrontation. In the first phase, the king states, I was wondering when you would show up. Pity we have to meet like this though. Come on, don't be silly. You're wrong, listen up. The whole place is teeming with monsters of course. We have to stop them, you have to stop them. Lives are on the line. The real enemy is, before he was able to reveal the name Geppetto, Romeo appears and notes, I have to kill you to stop it all. There's no other way. The laws of the Grand Covenant bind us. We're his puppets. It's gonna be okay, as long as I'm at your side, Carlo. Who's the puppet? You or me? Before the fight even began, the mechanical stage play clearly depicted Geppetto stealing our heart and placing it into the nameless puppet. Romeo was attempting to tell us the truth throughout the entire confrontation. At the time, we had no choice but to retaliate. Due to Geppetto's machinations, the source of the puppet frenzy was blamed on Romeo, a convenient enemy to remove from the equation. Additionally, Romeo attempted to make contact with P by dispatching the parade master and his flame Fuoco. Specifically, the King's Flame states, Learn his ways, join our mission, spread the flames, burn the impure. Don't forget brother, you're one of us. O oh, king, my king, we fight for humans, why can't you see it? Worship the king of puppets. Fuoco pleaded with us to join Romeo's mission against the infected. Burning the impure means to eradicate those infected with the disease. Once again, we were ignorant to the true purpose of Romeo and his puppets, and so neutralized them instead. With the puppet frenzy in full effect and the rampant spread of the affliction, it was time for Geppetto to send out P. But due to the mad donkey, he was prevented from returning to his hidden workshop within the train. During this time, P was awakened by Sophia for her own purpose and given a lamp of the Monad family containing Gemini. P and all of Romeo's forces were used by Geppetto to slaughter a mountain of puppets and humans so that Manus could absorb all the ergo required into the tower. Once we arrived at the peak, we removed Simon from the playing field as he had now fulfilled his role in Geppetto's plan. Through the manipulation of all others, the mastermind had obtained the astronomical quantity of ergo required and the arm of God. But Geppetto made a fatal error when he failed to realize that P would become a human being with his own free will. It is true that no parent should have to bury their child, but Geppetto's schemes were not the answer to his pain. He was willing to sacrifice the world to see his son again. Ironic, considering the memories of Carlo we witnessed on the beach. Evidently, Geppetto abandoned his son at the Monad Charity House, turning him into an orphan, missing key moments of his son's life, such as his graduation. When Carlo perished, Geppetto acknowledged how absent he truly was. Regret is stronger than gratitude, a phrase embodied by the actions of Geppetto, who moved heaven and earth to see his son again. Despite failing to achieve his original goal, he came to terms with reality once he saw P weeping. He realized the truth before the end. P may not be Carlo, but he was still his son. Upon the rooftops, we see a puppet modeled after Sophia. Drawing her ergo from his heart, P grants Sophia life anew. She holds P in her arms, akin to the Saintess of Mercy. Interestingly, perhaps the Saintess depicted in the statue is a reference to the listeners, 
In the past, a genius engineer, Camille, received a request from the alchemists and created a masterpiece. This was the Saintess of Mercy statue that brought back to life the puppets under golden divine protection. Sophia resurrected P endlessly throughout his journey, much like the Saintess portrayed in the statue. P sleeps soundly in her arms. Finally, in a letter left behind by Sophia, she notes the following. Thank you for giving me a new life. The fact that an ergo puppet can have a second life and become another kind of human requires more time for people to find out about it. The crack disaster has stopped. Still, there is the aftermath of the petrification disease and the puppets. Please heal the wounds for the people. You're the reason we have our freedom. I'm grateful you freed me from my puppet strings. Returning to the hotel, the residents are grateful. Kratz will need time to heal, but the immediate threat from Geppetto and Simon is over. Exploring the hotel further, we discover that the nose of Pete's painting has reached its limit. Removing the nose grants us with the armament Golden Lie. The growth of this weapon is directly linked to the lies we have told throughout our adventure. There are two kinds of lies. Yours is the lie that makes your nose long. The boy loved the fairy tale about the wooden puppet's adventure. At least the wooden puppet's father was kind. The description draws a comparison between the Geppetto of Krat to the Geppetto in the fairy tale, who was a kind and loving father towards Pinocchio. Found close to where Giangio once stood is a letter. It's amazing to see a new brother being born. I hope to meet you again, sometime on the eternal line of time. The initials refer to Giangio's true name, Philippus Paracelsus, a man considered legend even by the alchemists. His character is based on a Swiss philosopher, theologian, and alchemist of the same name, a lauded and avant-garde individual. Paracelsus in Lies of P is referred to as the Eternal, an apt name as he appears to be seeking or has somewhat obtained immortality. As noted earlier, the god who fell to earth and created Simon Manus also created other immortals alongside him, some of which still walk the earth. Perhaps Paracelsus was one of them. We witness him conversing with a woman over the phone. She asks him to report his findings, implying he was dispatched to Kratz on a mission. This partially explains why he coveted the gold coin tree, as the fruit which grew from the tree had miraculous properties that could potentially sustain one's lifespan beyond mortal means. It is also likely that he looked into Ergo and the petrification disease, just as Geppetto and the alchemist once did. However, during this investigation, he came into contact with P. He refers to P as a new brother, as he is eternal like himself. Paracelsus remarks that they should continue observing, and the woman responds by noting that they need to get his arm back, likely referring to Simon's arm of God. Lastly, he concludes by stating he is returning, and when he does, he will find a girl by the name of Dorothy. Standing over a sunlit crat, we see Dorothy humming and clapping her heels, a clear reference to the fairy tale Wizard of Oz. She is in the scope of Paracelsus, as she may also possess a form of immortality. It is theorized that the golden broken stargazer found in the path of the pilgrim is a potential entrance to the land of Oz. The golden hues of the stargazer draws parallels to the famous yellow brick road. Moreover, Dorothy in the fairy tale travels with a scarecrow, lion, and a tin man who desires his own heart so he can feel human emotion. The Tin Man may actually be the broken puppet found in the barren swamp. Either way, the tale is far from over. Paracelsus and his society are seeking likewise individuals, but for what purpose is unknown. The tale of Lies of P is one filled with tragedy, but it is not without hope. The alchemist's abuse of Ergo came with a price, the petrification disease. The over-reliance on this resource led to the rise and cataclysmic downfall of the once prosperous city of Krat. Punishment for their sadistic experiments and the pursuit of evolution at any cost. For Geppetto, he led a life of desperation to achieve his goals, only to realize what he likely knew already, Carlo was lost. A fool thinks himself to be wise, but a wise man knows himself to be a fool. A man of Geppetto's caliber deluded himself into thinking he could overcome death. 
time did not heal his pain, and his stubborn yet intelligent mind refused to accept this simple fact. His hollow choice to discard one life for another led him to his end. He made a remarkable achievement, birthing the human pea from a puppet. Ignorant of the weight of his achievement, creating sentient life, ultimately, he paid the price for his transgressions. In the end, we can only hope he found peace, knowing his son lives on, in one way or another. On the other hand, Simon Manus was twisted by the power bestowed upon him. The ability to know if a person is lying would be seen as a blessing by some, but for Simon, he could not stomach a world filled with lies, vowing instead to create a realm where one can only tell the truth, failing to understand that to lie is to be human. Without it, the world he sought to create would not be considered human at all. Moreover, even with all the power held in his palm, he could not have that which he coveted above all, the love of Sophia. Simon perished with his dreams in ruins and his love unrequited, a heavy price to pay. As for the King of Puppets, he truly believed he was Romeo. In reality, the King was akin to P, a marionette with the memories of a human, not quite the person whose memories they inherited, but a new individual entirely. Romeo clung to distant memories of the past and tried to reconnect with Carlo. He cherished his friendship, holding onto an item from Carlo to the bitter end, a necklace once worn by the King of Puppets. It is engraved with the boy's scribblings, to Romeo, your friend C. The boy resented his father for not showing any interest in him. Perhaps in protest, he gave his graduation necklace to Romeo, a friend he admired. In the end, Romeo was a soldier bound by the Grand Covenant. He had strength but not liberty, doomed to fail from the very beginning by Geppetto's design. A tragic hero, if there ever was one. And finally, we have P. A new purpose stirs in his heart. A life of liberty is laid before him. One of his first acts with his newfound freedom was to grant life to Sophia once more, perhaps repaying her kindness for rewinding the clock each time he died. As long as his will remained, he can never truly lose. Unfettered, Sophia can now write her own fate. Were it not for the death of Carlo, P would not be alive, Geppetto and Simon would be left unchecked, and Sophia would remain imprisoned eternally. P was born from a father's desperation, free from any strings, to be sacrificed at a specific moment. Despite being born with freedom, in the end, it was challenged and had to be won. After all, defeating the nameless puppet allows us to obtain its weapon, the aptly named proof of humanity, proof of our life. To remain free, to make a simple choice, such as lie or tell the truth, to protect those you love, this is what spurs P to fight. No one is truly alive until they are free. For P, his life begins now. Humanity sullied its own sanctum long before I found it, blasphemed against itself. Krat became a city of monsters and petrification disease because of Simon's terrible experiments. The suburbs are sealed off. There's no escape. Communications cut off too. Someone planned this all out. Everyone's dead. From the petrification disease or from the monsters. I didn't die. But my heart breaks more each day. The disease does not signify death. It's the process of purifying a person's essence. Sometimes you meet people who make you believe they'll always be with you. But a life can be snuffed out at any moment. I am bereft of emotion. My life, or what passes for it, has lost meaning. It feels like pain has swallowed me whole. I'm sick of it. I'm sick of Krat. Sick to death of just surviving. Hurting, stealing, kidnapping. Surviving. When the hell does it end? Monsters, humans, puppets, they all hate me. Even puppets have hearts, do they not? Perhaps all we need is something that helps us perceive what they're feeling. That wasn't a very good 
father to you. I gave you more loneliness than love. I wanted you to grow up as a good boy in a peaceful world. And yet, I think all I've taught you is blood and violence. I dreamed of this day for so long. The moment you'd come back to life. Does he think he's better than everyone trying to protect me from a distance? He could have at least said something. All I wanted was a chance to meet my real family. When you came in, you reminded me of the Hound. Probably because both of you saved my life. You're able to choose your own path, unbound by anything. You know, in many ways, I envy you. Your strength. Now, our only hope is you. Is this the real you? Whatever choice you make, I shall wait for you. Thank you so much for watching. We would like to take a moment to thank our sponsor, Raid Shadow Legends, for helping make this video possible. Don't forget to use our link in the description or scan the QR code to receive in-game bonuses. Also, a huge thank you to our patrons for consistently supporting us throughout our journey. Please visit our page at patreon.com forward slash the brothers code and take a look at what we have to offer. Subscribe to our channel to stay up to date on our future projects. Of course, we'll be covering Elden Ring Shadow of the Earth Tree, so stay tuned for that. Leave a like to show your support and help spread our content to a wider audience. And comment down below letting us know what you thought of the video. Thank you, we'll be back with more soon.